This is our fifth event in our ongoing series, Trending Questions, where we respond to big questions people are asking around the world. If you missed the past trending questions, you can feel free to go to our YouTube page or Facebook page and check those out. They are all online. And make sure you hang with us until the very end. I'm going to give you some information about upcoming events. Tonight, we're going to attempt to tackle the important question, is environmental justice possible? And because of what is currently going on in our environment, tonight's trending questions is a little bit different. We have decided to use the blessings of technology to go with a live stream only format of this event. However, we do have some, a few friends and staff and family in the audience because we'd really hate to not have anyone here to laugh at Nathan's jokes or at least just laugh at Nathan. Um, These trending question events are really at the core of what we do as a ministry. As a global ministry, we like to address people's big questions that are going on all around culture, all around the globe. So regardless of where in the world you might meet one of our speakers on RZM's global speaking team, we all consider it a great privilege to take your questions and handle them carefully, provide honest, accurate, and biblical responses. And so regardless of your faith background, we are very happy that you chose to tune in with us now. So some of you may be waking up, some of you should be asleep already, and some of you are just gearing down for the night. So regardless of what time zone you find yourself in, we're very happy that you've honored us with uh, joining us online. The layout of tonight is we're going to start as we usually do with an interview of the speaker, but tonight it is speakers, which I'll get to in a minute. And then we're going to go into the talk on is environmental justice possible? And then we'll have a time of Q&A. And for that Q&A, you can feel free to submit your questions through Pigeonhole Live, which is an online platform that we use where it's simple, interactive, and you can go there, submit your questions, and you can actually see other people's questions in there and vote on them. And we can see kind of what, what is trending on Pigeonhole. So what you do is you go to pigeonhole.at pigeonhole.at and type in the passcode when it asks you. The passcode is TQ0313. That's TQ0, not the letter O, the number zero, 313. And if you submit questions there, as questions come up throughout the presentation, feel free to submit them there and we will um, be able to take some of those after the talk is given. And for that time, we have Nathan Rittenhouse and Zandra Carroll who are going to be taking your questions. So, While we're online, you can help support this event and spread its reach by sharing this in whatever social media you're currently watching through or that you're connected to. Share about this event. If you're going to share something about the event, could you please use the hashtag trending questions? We'd really appreciate that. Another place I want to tell you about is rzimconnect.org. It is the RZIM online family global community where you can go and get personal and credible answers to your questions of faith. Tonight's talk, there's a discussion already been going on about tonight's event. So Jason Walker recently wrote that he made a comment that I couldn't agree with more, stating that this topic is on time, which means it's timely, which I, I, I agree with you. Uh, Jason, we hope you enjoy tonight's event. With all that said, let me introduce tonight's speakers and then we'll get them up so we can get right into it. So the speaker for tonight's talk, Is Environmental Justice Possible?, is Nathan Rittenhouse. Nathan Rittenhouse is from West Virginia. He is a speaker for Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. He graduated with a double major in physics and philosophy and religion and a minor in mathematics. So he kept busy throughout those times. And then he went on to study theology and apologetics at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. And after that, he went on to Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary to get his Master's of Divinity there. One thing I love about uh, Nathan, he comes to mind for me, usually when I'm talking to someone around the topic of them thinking Christianity is a boring religion, because uh, he, I think, specializes in really pushing that line in what I call clean fun. Um, And if you hear his stories, he's a great storyteller, which I hope you'll hear some stories tonight, but um, he's a great person of actually taking you into the, the depths where you're wondering, is this okay? Uh, this is, seems a little bit risky and dangerous. And I think about him and my, my, you know, our kids in a canoe in a lake, chasing turtles around the lake with the kids, you know, with the canoe about to tip over. He's a great, great friend. Absolutely love this man. 
So excited to hear from him tonight. And then Zandra Carroll is an adjunct speaker with RZM, and she currently resides in Colorado. Zandra has a bachelor's degree in biological science, also studied apologetics and theology at Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, and she went on from Oxford to obtain her master's degree in conservation biology at Victoria University at Wellington, of Wellington in New Zealand. Her research includes parasitology, ecological restoration, and some other areas that I'm not going to attempt to pronounce for fear of saying them wrong, but she can help straighten me out when she gets up here. They're both impressive in many ways um, in terms of their intellectual capacity, their educational background, but as, as dear friends who I love, one of the things I love most about them is their heart for people and their love for God. They have both in different ways encouraged me throughout my life and both of them have even confronted me at times on things I needed to know in order to grow in my faith, which I so appreciate friends like that. So it's my great privilege to welcome them to the stage. Zandra, Nathan, will you come join me, please? <clears throat> welcome, guys. Thank you, thank you. Glad you are here. Glad you made it. That's right. A little bit touch and go. T <laughs> took a while. Took Tell a while. us about your plane. Well, my plane's landing gear would not go up. And so we flew around for a little while, and then they realized that with the drag, they didn't have enough fuel to get here, so we had to take another stop uh, along the way. So it only took me about four and a half hours longer than usual. But well, A lot I better am. than the other option of it. Yeah, right. It's down. better to have your landing gear down than yeah. stuck up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> I'm sure you would have figured out how to rig it somewhere or another. Everybody stomp at the same time. That, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. every time. Exactly. One, two, three, go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, good. Glad to have you guys out here. Um, we're going to, during this time, we usually spend a little bit of time just getting to know you guys a little bit more personally. So I'd love to hear, um, we could start with you, Nathan, talking a little bit about like your background, uh, where you, I already said you're from West Virginia. Share a little bit about yourself, maybe your journey into what it was like to become a Christian. Just share some background on sure. yourself. Yeah. So I, um, sometimes sort of jokingly have introduced myself as the happiest guy that I know. Um, and maybe that's a little over the top, but I um, just really had a wonderful uh, childhood. My family came to the States in the 1600s from Germany and then ran around in Pennsylvania and Maryland. Oh, way back. Way back, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> 78 minutes later, but all that to say that a long history of... Um, faithful service to the church and deep adventure. My grandparents were in Ecuador where my dad was born and then they moved from Ecuador to West Virginia, which is not the usual way you get from Pennsylvania to West Virginia. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, just uh, great, great parents, great grandparents, um, good church community, fun brothers. Um, and so I had a, a kind of a, a wonderful idyllic childhood in that sense. I uh, grew up, went to college, um, grew, grew up in a family that really encouraged asking questions. And I think that's a big part of who I am today that I asked my mother thousands of questions uh, every night before I went to bed. And rather than fluffing them off, she really took those seriously. And so I think a, a core part of who I was or, and am now comes from the fact that I uh, was with people that asked me challenging questions because they thought I might actually know something about it even when I was little and brought me into that conversation. Um, so married, have four children now and try to uh, replicate that in the next generation of helping them see how what it is that I believe connects to all aspects and elements of life and then asking them questions and allowing them to ask me questions in return is a fun way to live. And you, uh, other than feeding chickens, which you do, I have a, I collect hobbies for a hobby. Yeah, that's that's part of you, you what sure I do. do. You yeah. sure do. We could we could actually spend a, quite a bit of time tonight just talking about his hobbies. But one of the thing one thing came to mind when you mentioned your mom. I remember you one time telling me about your time speaking at some of the you know Ivy League schools at universities, and you mentioned your mom in that. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's one of my favorite things that you no, said. No, well, is it, about the idea of like. You're just sharing what your mom shared. Oh, with right. Yeah. Something? So some people are like, oh, that's really profound. I'm like, yeah, my mom told me that when I was like seven. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm I plagiarizing that. my mother uh, to work for RZIM. <laughs> I guess since she's your, mom, she's your mom, you're allowed to do that. I guess so. Um, great. Well, thanks. And Zandra, a little bit about yourself, the background, a little bit. Uh, we'll get into some of the other things in terms of tonight and science and whatnot, which I know is a huge part of your background. But just even just your journey into Christianity, a little bit of what it was like growing up for you. Who are you? Where do you come from? Yeah, who am I? I'm still figuring that out. No, I'm kidding. Deep questions. Uh, yeah, so starting with the deep questions tonight. Um, so yeah, I have two tremendous parents um, who raised me to be very inquisitive and very creative. Um, they're both authors and artists, and um, they're both 
lifetime learners, you know, self-taught in a lot of ways. So some of my earliest memories are being in San Diego, California, and tromping around the tidal pools with my father and having him teach me about all the animals, you know, the sea anemones and the hermit crabs and all of that. And so from a very early age, I was enchanted by nature and wanted to learn more. And that's part of what got me into biology. And that's part of how my faith grew as well, because the more I learned about the natural world, the more I found myself falling in love with its creator. Have you always loved, had, a, had a love for animals? Because I remember when I came to your house, I think it was 2015, you had a rat, a turtle, um, I don't know if you had any other animals, but they were just odd ones for me to see together. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I've always been that way from a very young child. I mean, my parents were very, <laughs> very patient with me. At, at one point, I think in my bedroom, I had a turtle, a koi, a couple of hamsters, and some birds that sort of had free reign of the room. So they'd kind of fly around, you know, and I had all these plants growing. Check your I, pillow every night. Yeah, I, I had trained vines to grow across the ceiling, so it really looked like a jungle. So, I, yeah, I've always loved, typically, unless they're biting me, I really love animals. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Well, get to, stepping more into the uh, science, I actually want to go with um, Xandra, off of something that you shared. We have, one of the things I do here at RZAM as well is I, with Ivy Tyson, we host a podcast called Cover to Cover. We recently um, had Xandra join us for a chapter and there was a story you told when we were talking about getting into science um, about, your, about pan, pancakes. I'd love to even, I'd love you just to share that, that, that little story. Right, so the pancake story. Um, when my brother and I were still fairly young children, I have a very fond memory of my father um, putting out a blanket in the backyard and we, we made some pancakes and then we sat out at night under the stars and we just ate these pancakes for a long time and he taught us all about all the different constellations and the planets and um, he's just that kind of guy. He was a really fun dad. So a lot of uh, my inquisitive nature and my love for science, I think I owe to him. That's great because I, I, when we were talking, we were ta discussing the chapter of Scientology in the book Jesus Among Secular Gods and we were talking about the fine tuning and kind of how you got even into looking at um, cosmology and whatnot. I, I just found that really, it starts at a very young age of being just brought into this. And so I'll come back to you um, again, but as Nathan, on this particular topic, as we're getting into environmental justice, I actually hadn't heard this term prior to us even thinking yeah. about speaking to something around the environment. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I was like, this is a really interesting term. And now, now I've learned not just from you, yeah. but I've seen it more now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you were onto something being trending. Um, what, y you spent a time in your, I mean, I think of going to seminary in your theology degree, all the different things yeah. you could do, but you chose to do this particular topic as an independent study, which I just find like not really fitting in seminary <laughs> all, well. So tell us a little bit about yeah. like what drew you into that. Sure, yeah, and we should say that the, the phrase um, environmental justice has a technical legal definition in the way that it's used. Climate justice is often used in different parts of the world. Um, but when we're looking at the overall environment, I think one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm just a curious person. I have a lot of questions about how things are connected and how they fit together. Um, and so when I started pushing into this, I was actually taking a different ethics course and I uh, had asked if I could pitch this and there was a, a, a bit of immediate pushback actually because the, the topic in and of itself in a, and this might be unique to America, in a, in a theological context, isn't always, uh, there isn't always a positive association there. Mm -hmm. And so what I did to sort of blunt the edge of that a little bit is I named my independent study a non-hippie theology of creation care for non-vegetarians, <laughs> considering the role of the ox and orthodox. Um, <laughs> and so I thought maybe by adding a little bit of humor into it of saying, you know, this isn't a, um, I'm not going in the direction that maybe people have a, a negative connotation about it, but I wanna look seriously at this as a theological issue, just um, primarily because I'm curious. And so that led me down uh, a lot of rabbit trails of um, historical reading of interviewing pastors in rural and urban areas, conventional and organic farmers, and different folks at different places and spectrums. Um, actually starting with the idea of, we, th we talk in apologetics a lot about worldview, and what if we could start that conversation by actually talking to somebody about what their view of the world is? 
of the physical world and use that as a gateway into a broader conversation. And so that was mm. um, partly my own curiosity, but partly also recognizing that there was an avenue of, of a, a common interest in language that wasn't being engaged um, or was, but wasn't being publicly engaged in a robust way from a Christian perspective. And so, I mean, even this, your title, it took me a while to actually get all that is in there. <laughs> yeah. So you may need to re like back this up and listen to the title again and just try to catch all that is within that. Th th say it again. It's, yeah, so, so it's- Yeah, a, go, go a, ahead. A, so unpack it this, the, the jovial name, I think, is on my transcript, it says Theology 760 or something. They <laughs> but my, my title was A Non-Hippie Theology of Creation Care for Non-Vegetarians. And what I was doing is not, I, I know people who are hippies and vegetarians, like it's not anti that, but it's separating from, I think people sometimes in the more conservative Christian realm automatically assume that if you start thinking about environmental ethics, then we've swung all the way over to, oh, now you're gonna, you know, try to convince me to be a vegetarian or something. Um, and so I was trying to take, put some humor in there to take some of the, uh, the fullness of the, that pendulum swing out of it to say there's, there's a whole lot of room here in the middle that needs to be dealt with well we can't reject a conversation because we're fearful of certain extreme ways in which it's been used in the past. Mm. One thing I love about hanging out with Nathan is you realize one, how much you don't know about particular topics, but also how much he knows about different topics. I remember walking to the produce aisle and I did not realize the download of information that was gonna come to me about the world <laughs> just by walking by a little pail of spinach with, with Nathan. I was like, thanks for that. <laughs> do my best to remember that. So, um, and Xandra, for you, I mean, you got your master's degree in conservation biology and what was it particularly about, and tell us the other words that I, the other studies that I couldn't, is it flow that you studied? I just oh, don't wanna mess it up. That's all right, it's called flow cytometry. Cytometry, okay, it's I thought it was a spelling cell error. biology. Okay. Yeah, I was studying human blood cells. Um, yeah, I've studied parasitology, which is a study of parasites, and then human blood cells, so there's apparently a creepy side to me, sorry about that. Yeah. But it's fascinating, it's a fascinating field where you agitate single cells with a laser to learn more about them. Wow, yeah. and, then, and then you made this jump into conservation biology in particular. Tell us about why and then... To preserve parasites. <laughs> Duh, <Of> right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then, and then, and then what, that, what particularly did you do there? What was that like? Oh, so, well, for one thing, I did it in New Zealand, which is a fascinating place to study biology. They have very strange plants and animals there. Um, they have a giant flightless parrot that just waddles around really awkwardly. Um, they have bats that don't fly. Um, they have gigantic flowers that have grown into gigantic trees because of island gigantism. So it's, it's really a fun place to study biology. My particular focus had to do with bird conservation and particularly restoration. So in my field, I was um, writing translocation proposals for certain species of um, birds that were on extinction's doorstep, basically. How do we take a population of bird safely get them together in some sort of box or net or something and helicopter them out of there and then let them go in a safe place so they can survive, breed, and repopulate. How does that happen? What does that look like? Um, so I was that, that was part of what I did for my master's degree, trying to solve those problems. Okay, and you particularly went there to, uh, you partic could you choose to do birds? Or was there a particular reason that you chose birds? Yeah, well, I've always been fascinated with birds. And... Um, there are 77 species of bird that have gone extinct already in New Zealand. Species of bird that have gone extinct. So um, part of me hoping to be a conservation biologist um, uh, with birds has to do with going to a place where the need is greatest, and for me, New Zealand was one of those places. Mm. Fascinating, and I mean, New Zealand, bummer, hard. And also, <laughs> hard, <right? laughs> come on, it's New Zealand. <laughs> it's beautiful, right? yeah. yeah. Well, great. Well, we'll get more into um, maybe some of the science and environmental stuff as we get into Q&A. But I want to know, like, right now, what are some other things you guys like to think about, speak about, are passionate about? Yeah, uh, maybe I'll answer that first on a kind of a categorical level. I think one of the things that is fascinating for me that if Christianity is true, if Jesus is Lord of everything, then there isn't a topic that we can't start talking about and see how that connects to our faith. Kind of a little bit of that taking every thought captive idea that Paul has. And so for me, it's not necessarily just a specific category or set of ideas. It's the breadth 
of Christianity as it touches all elements of reality, that's of a fascination to me. And so I enjoy those sort of um, And okay, as a Christian, this is how my faith informs that idea. And so um, it's more of a, a direction and a posture of topics and ideas more than a, a single one. Hmm. Um, so, and, and maybe that's why I, I spent some time thinking about this as well is because I, I want to see how does Christianity speak to this issue? Yeah, great. And how about, how about you, Xander? Are there other topics outside of the you know, science, conservation, biology, that you, which I know you speak on, been on university missions where you give some excellent talks on this and link it into the gospel and human value? What, other than that, are there other topics that you're passionate about? Uh, there are many, many topics that I'm passionate about, probably too many. I probably need to narrow it down. But as a young speaker, there are so many avenues that I'm exploring and still learning about. Um, but... Uh, I guess touching a bit on the human value that you mentioned, um, one topic that I've been exploring a lot and speaking on often has to do with human suffering and where is God in my suffering? Um, trying to answer that question and wrestle with those things. So um, I'm obviously quite attracted by the technical side, the academic side, um, the scientist in me really likes that, but there's also another side, another aspect, which is the human heart. Uh, how do we deal with anxiety and fear? Um, and particularly in today's culture, I think those questions are worth answering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything, and Nathan, I know you've been working, gearing up to tonight, to work on tonight's topic, is, but is there anything in particular that you're working on, that you're looking towards, like, speaking on next, like, you're, that you're really excited about? Well, in the past, I've been doing, um, yeah, a good bit on the, the concept of sustainability of satisfaction. I think we think about environmental sustainability, but what about satisfaction? What does it mean to be fully human in that sense? And so there's a, a continuation sort of of those themes of what does it mean to function properly as a human? And is there a degree of, of pleasure of participating um, in the way in which we are created uh, in, in the way in which we were created to fit into the way that God made the world. So there are a number of themes that pop off of that um, as I go along that will be coming up in the next few months as a continuation of some of the things I've been thinking about in the past. Um, part of it is that I think in the idea of sustainability, why do we want to sustain something that isn't good? Mm. <laughs> oh, well, this is a terrible situation. I hope it's sustainable. No, that's not how, that's not how that should work. Um, and so thinking about the ideas in Christianity where it doesn't necessarily contradict reality, but challenges us to consider whether or not our gaze has been too low and to see a bigger picture and to step into uh, a deeper level and a, and a fuller vision of what God has for us. So there are a number of, of topics along that line that I'm working on and pondering. Hmm. I can see where that can play and even with the topic of um, human suffering, asking yeah. some questions around that that idea of sustaining something that's not, from the, <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. the, the objection of suffering sometimes yep. comes as like, why is it, why is suffering exists? But then you're like, well, mm -hmm. but then you might also fight for, to sustain it. So is it really, <laughs> right, is yeah, it is really that, that big of a problem? Right, yeah. I never actually thought about that. Yeah. You just, I think there also is that I, um, in my, just in my normal interactions uh, in friendships and communities span a couple generations in my friendships. And so I, I think I spend a lot of time sort of in cultural translation also. Uh, between the church and the university. If when you say this, this is what it sounds like, and <laughs> when they do this, it's in response to this. Um, but also looking at what are the thing, what are the forms of human knowledge that can't be digitally preserved? What happens when we substitute grandpa for Google? What are the forms of wisdom that don't get translated into another generation? And so I have a, an interest in the way that technology shapes the way that we ask questions also. So that would be another part of that. Yeah. I think one thing I really appreciate about the two of these um, friends is what you just said there, substituting grandpa for Google, I, I feel like I've heard wisdom that Nathan has shared and said like, well, grandpa once said this and qu <laughs> quotes grandpa. I'm like, grandpa's really smart. I quote a lot of people, <laughs> I quote a lot of people. Yeah, and then also um, just thinking of Xander, I mean, one thing I didn't mention about Xander is just like, the extensive travel you've done. Oftentimes when I'm talking to you, I'll hear a story about some new story. I didn't know you lived there. And all of a sudden you bring in some other cultural perspective too. What, what do you, where's your, in terms of all your travels, is there a favorite place that you um, ha have traveled? And why? Oh, that's such a hard question to I know, answer. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. It's a wonderful question. Um, I think one of the places that I really loved traveling was Thailand. And part of that may have been the experience itself because my best friend at the time and I um, just 
happened to fly to Thailand for like a month and we went backpacking all over the entire country just with not a lot of provisions and zero plan. And it was really, really fun. And also the tropical biologist in me was eating it up because the jungles there are beautiful and the people are incredible. So that was pretty fun. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, great. I, I, we could talk much longer. I have a lot of questions and a lot of things I'd love to say to love people to get to know you guys um, more at a more personal level. But we want to get into tonight's topic. So Xander and I are going to exit stage. You can feel free to take your position there at the podium. And we loved, we are excited to hear what you have to share with us tonight. And then we'll come back up when you're done and join for q Yeah, and I'm excited to hear the questions that come in and yeah. hear what Xander has to say great. about them. So well, thanks, guys. Great. Let's do it. Well, I really am looking forward to uh, this, this time and this topic. It's one that I do with a bit of trepidation because there's so much to it. It's connected to so many different uh, avenues and elements of reality that I feel like I'm not doing total justice to the topic, but we'll do the best that we can. We'll hit the tips of the icebergs before they melt here and, um, <laughs> uh, sorry, and um, then and see what comes in, in Q&A. So I thought I'd start off with this quote. You may have seen something like this uh, in your Twitter feed on social media as a, as a headline in the media, the growing possibility of our destroying ourselves and the world within uh, ourselves and the world with our own neglect and excess is tragic and is very real. And so I think there's a way in which we look at that and we think about that. You can analyze that intellectually. Oftentimes when people look at a topic like that, there's also an emotional response to that of either uh, lament, despair, embrace, rejection of goofiness, putting that at arm's length. Um, and I'll let you guess who said that, uh, but by giving you a little hint, think uh, it's been on the cover of Time Magazine, uh, name has a capital G in it, it would be? Billy Graham. That's right. Um, and so <laughs> for some of you, that might not have been where you thought that was going because there's a Greta Thunberg who's also recently been on uh, Time Magazine's cover and it says things that are maybe a little bit uh, less joyful than that even. But the reason that that's important is that Billy Graham wrote this uh, 20 years before Greta was born. And when we look at that, if that puts you at a position of, of surprise in one way or another, um, it highlights, I think, a cultural shift that's happened in the last several decades of the fact that we immediately associate this as a political statement almost. And Billy Graham doesn't fit that political model and mold. I mean, when we look at that, we think, well, yeah, that that's comes from the political left and liberal. And, and Billy Graham, he wasn't that. Uh, and, and that's true. I'm not trying to make an, uh, an environmentalist out of Billy Graham. He was an, he was an evangelist. But evangelists are evangelists because they care about reality and they care about the world. And so when he says something like this, this wasn't uh, politically motivated. It wasn't based off of any social pressure that he was under. This was based off of an experience that he had as a child of finding one of his family's uh, dairy cows dead along the river. There had been an industrial spill upstream that put enough toxins into the river to kill their cattle. Uh, and if you can imagine there being enough toxin in a river to kill a cow, um, <laughs> what's going on with the rest of the life in the stream probably uh, isn't much of a, uh, a guess for us. And so he's, he's speaking out of that, of a real observation of things that happen in the world. And he's saying that as a Christian in a way that isn't meant to be uh, a, a social commentary. Same thing is true for somebody, you could look at somebody like the life of John Stott, great English kind of the people's theologian and teacher, who in his final book, The Radical Disciple, as he was kind of recognizing that his ministry was coming to an end, sort of wrote a final uh, things that we need to do a better job of as a church, things I wish I would have spoken more clearly on in chapter four of that is on creation care and something that he recognized as a place where the Christian voice needs to be heard. And he sort of has a little uh, three-step way of interacting with that. He said, we need to avoid the deification of creation. And that's a healthy thing to remember. We don't worship the earth. But he said, we also need to avoid the extreme on the other side, which is the exploitation of the earth. And the middle ground there is to work in cooperation with God. And so these men were speaking about this issue as well-known, uh, well-traveled, well-connected Christian men out of a theological conviction and out of the real experiences they had with various parts of the world. And for those of you who are um, in the literary world and enjoy people like uh, Flannery O'Connor and Marilyn Robinson, you'll know that these are ladies who often look to and reference the work of Simone Weil and some of her kind of uh, French reconstruction after the war philosophy. And Simone Weil often says things that are based off this idea that obligations precede rights. 
And so when we start adding the justice language into this, um, in the more modern way in which we talk about it, this idea that obligations precedes rights is, is true and it's an intuitively true in some sense we know this is true because it makes sense to us. You can't have human rights without having some sort of idea of an obligation of the intrinsic value of humanity. So there are deeper moral obligations that are first true and then we have rights and moral, oblig and moral um, dictates that are based off of those pre-existing obligations. And so the question we sort of want to wrestle with here for a moment, whatever worldview you're coming to this with, is what are the obligations or what are the moral frameworks or moral interest and obligations that we have as it pertains to the natural world around us? Now, as you're coming to this question as a Christian, in no way are we starting from scratch on this, and we're certainly not happen, hopping on a bandwagon of like, oh, this is a popular idea now, we should speak about this. There's a, a rich history here of Christian engagement on this, uh, on literally thousands of years now of engagement on this. And uh, you can see why in the interview that Sean was doing with us, why I titled it a non-hippie theology of creation care, because that's we don't need to trend in that direction to have an interest in this. We just have to trend in a conservative uh, theological direction to be interested in this. And in fact, as you start pushing into this, uh, there's a book called Inherit the Holy Mountain by Mark Stoll. And he makes a case that actually, if you look at the conservation issues of early American environmentalism, that they were all started by people who either grew up in or were one generation removed from Christian households, specifically in the Northeast. And his point is, is that the interest in nature and conservation did not come from the transcendentalist. They were read later. It was actually the early, those who grew up in Christian households. He's not saying that John Muir and all of them were like evangelical Christians, but they were deeply influenced by the worldview of a goodness to creation and nature, Roosevelt and the rest of them, um, that were deeply formed by their Christian upbringings. Independently of that, uh, a year or two ago, I read 22 Christian biographies of well-known Christian evangelists, preachers, speakers, writers, travelers, um, and it wasn't a series, it was just a, a hodgepodge of different publishers and books that I kind of read sequentially. Um, and all 22 of these uh, really well-known Christian speakers spent a ridiculous amount of time in nature and wrote very deeply about their experiences with God in nature um, and had very uh, well-formed theologies of God's physical world and how it pertained to their faith. We can go back farther than that. You get, obviously, in the New Testament record, but then farther back into the Psalms, like Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, um, because he founded the earth on the seas and he formed it, he made it, it's his. And that language is all throughout the Psalms. So we can go back even farther, all the way back into the beginning of Genesis and see that God cares deeply and we find our moral foundation and obligations pronounced and uh, pronounced as good from God from the get-go. Now, I would say that actually most Christians, whether consciously or subconsciously, function with this frame of reference in their mind. One of the ways that this interestingly stood out to me was a year or two ago, Ravi and Vince Vitale were speaking in Pennsylvania at a large kind of stadium auditorium, and I was there for some of the media stuff off to the side. And as the event was wrapping up, I was standing in the curtains on the edge, and there was a team of about 15 people who had been hired to clean the floor of the stadium after the event. And as this crowd of thousands of people receded, a gasp went through the cleaners because as the people stepped back, the floor was nearly spotless. And all of the younger workers said, we've never seen this happen before. And one of the older men laughed and he said, oh, I've seen this once before and listed a Christian band who had played there. I thought that's fascinating that he made a connection that Christians aren't the ones who just throw their stuff on the floor and expect somebody else to take care of it. That there was a, a respect for my action causes somebody else to have to do this thing. And I don't think anybody there would say, oh, I'm really an environmentalist and that's why I didn't throw my French fry wrapper thing on the floor. Um, it's a general respect of recognizing that the, the things that I do have an impact and an effect on other people. The other one that is really interesting to me is in our hymns that we sing. Um, and so you don't have to go back that far before people used to still sing hymns. And I started making a list of all the hymns that are about glorifying God in creation. And then I finally gave up and quit. This got to be a huge list of all creatures of our God and King, even in the doxology, praise him all creatures here below. This is my father's world for the beauty of the earth. Uh, joy to the world. Even if you don't sing a lot of hymns, uh, Joy to the world at Christmas time. You've probably sung this. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Did anybody here ever sing that? You bunch of hippies. I knew it. Um, but it's, it's fascinating that when we look through the, through the depth of our, the way that we sing, and you're saying, okay, well, even, you know, my church doesn't sing hymns. Okay, what is in the background of your praise courses? 
mountains, rivers, valleys, streams, sunsets. Now, some of you have that one that looks like a hybrid between a laser show and Windows 7 rebooting. But for the most part, um, it's these beautiful panoramic views of, of creation. And why does that put us in a, in a position of worship? But as I, I, I have a, <laughs> I was talking about collecting hobbies, I have a collection of hymnals also. And I like to go through and look at time areas of what people sang about. Did you know, I have a hymnal that has a whole collection of hymns on prohibition. When was the last time you sang a good old prohibition hymn? Um, yeah, no, no takers here, probably not online either. But there was a time in which that was sung about. Another hymnal that I have is really interesting. It has a whole section, like you know how if you've ever looked at a hymnal, they're topical, so Advent, you know, blah, 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 whatever. And then there's one on science, a whole section on science. And then a list of hymns where we sang praising God for science and hymns that use the word science as part of a Sunday morning cor corporate worship. What happened there? What happened to our hymns about science? Well, I think what we see on an issue like that is that there are things that are th from our theological past that then became socio-politically contentious and we dropped our voice in that because we didn't want to associate with the direction that culture was going with that. And it made me pause and wonder, all of these hymns and the songs that we now sing that extol the goodness of God as manifest through creation, is that part of our future or is that part of our past? Is that something where we'll let our voice drop and we'll say, well, a long time ago it was that Christians really saw this deeply, took the Psalms seriously and God's commands, or will we drop our voice in doing that? Now, we don't want to be flippant about that because as one of my friends who lives in D.C. said, I'd like to have a voice on this, but in America, as soon as you start speaking on this, you get lumped in with all sorts of other isms. Uh, in fact, you guys, there are people watching who are skeptical of me right now because I'm talking about environmentalism who would question my theological orthodoxy, and you got to watch out for people with beards, let's be honest. Um, there's, there's that element to it, and so he's right. You get lumped in with all these other isms in, in our time. Socialism is a big part of that. Almost the national narrative, when you see this in the media, is a link between environmentalism and socialism in a way that's sort of fascinating. And actually, can we get the, the full Billy Graham quote here? Um, this is important as it speaks to um, kind of, I think, a difference between where Billy Graham was hitting this and maybe where the modern trajectory of this goes, because he says, I find myself becoming more and more an advocate of the true ecologist. So notice he doesn't say activist in governments, where their re recommendations are realistic. Many of these people, again, not activists, people, scientists, have done us an essential service in helping us preserve and protect our green zones and our cities, our water and our air. And then the quote that fits into that context that the growing possibility of our destroying ourselves and the world with our own neglect and excess is tragic and very real. And so he's saying, I'm, I'm for this. Science has done a great service to us at the point to which it's a realistic alternative. And I think that's where people start to like, it's almost mock the system where you're looking at something that's kind of propagated through the voice of childhood uh, while at the same time recognizing that children on average spend four to seven minutes out time, outside a day and seven hours of screen time, and you're like, that's the generation that's going to tell us how nature works? Um, seems like there's a, a disconnect there. And so there's that element of it, but then as it gets, my, my thinking was, well, how does this then get linked back into economics in a way um, that really seems hopeful to anybody? And I was reading um, a bunch of different travel writers. So these are people who fly around the world to write about the environment and feel bad about it because they're flying to write about the environment. And one of the authors in, or one of one of the articles uh, said something that kind of clicked for me, and she wrote this. She said, what's more, climate change is terrifying. And because the solutions lie with government decision-making and transformation of big systems like energy, agriculture, and transportation, they feel far beyond what we as individuals can control. And so that's a really normal sounding sentence in our time, but one where I'm like, what? Think about that for just a second. What you're saying there is that transportation, energy, and agriculture are now all the role of the government. And that's not one that I'm ready to swallow yet. Um, but what that does is that allows me to step aside from my individual responsibility and the consequences of my individual actions because that's just a drop in the bucket. But where the big change really happens is in a system outside of myself and the government is going to fix this for me. Now, depending on your view of the way that the government and the world works, uh, you'll have some different thoughts there. But I think it's helpful for me to make that link and that connection between environmentalism and socialism as saying the problem is so big that I can't do it. Therefore, my best hope is for the government to do this for me. It's actually a fascinating statement of our own individual incompetence. 
That's where it irks me just a little bit of saying, I can't do this for myself, so I need the government to do this. And if you read Wendell Berry, you'll see a repeated theme where he's pushing into the idea that modern man has been conditioned by economics to be totally dependent. I mean, what are the things that you produce for yourself that are necessities? Do we build our own houses? Did you grow your own food? You buy your water. If you want to plant a plant, you buy dirt for it. And in fact, he says the only necessity that modern man is actually routinely harvesting for himself is air. And that's just because people haven't figured out a way to sell that to you yet. Um, but maybe that's coming. And so there's a personal responsibility and a personal ability and action statement that's baked into some of these ideas that, um, and that's not to say the governments don't have responsibilities. Don't hear me saying that, but I'm not sure that I want to put my, all the eggs in that basket right off the bat at this point. And as Sean said, I do like to quote Grandpa, who is fond of saying, and those who are old enough to remember, that the problem with dependency on the government is, is that you pay for dependency in units of freedom. That's played out time and time again around the world, that once I want the government to be in charge of agriculture, then they get to tell me what I eat. And maybe that hasn't always worked out well all around the world. So the thing that is part of that, those isms, also despair gets linked into the environmental movement in a unique way. And I think there's a link to be made here. And you've read topics about this, like eco-anxiety. Here's one from the Washington Post um, that says, quote, as climate change continues unabated, parents, teachers, and medical professionals across the country find themselves face to face with a quandary. How do you raise a generation to look forward to the future with hope when all around them swirls a message of apparent hopelessness? How do you prepare today's children for a world defined, defined by environmental trauma without inflicting more trauma yourself? And where do you find the line between responsible education and undue alarmism? And so there's a, there's a posture there, and some of that I think is over the top. I, I like to kind of look at the, the footage of these protests and stuff, and you see the reporter uh, interviewing the six-year-old. Um, well, I'm sure somebody who couldn't walk in 2015 remembers a lot about what the climate used to be. You know, um, some of that has to be taught. It's not observed. And so I think there's a, a, a caution here that comes from that article of saying, how much of this are we inflicting? How, much, how do we balance that line with reality? And then there's just a, some more ridiculousness that sort of goes along with these isms of like, well, I'm not going to school because I don't have a future, so why would I go to school? And I'm kind of thinking, well, I'm sure the ability to read and do math wouldn't be helpful to this conversation at all. Um, so there's that. But then when you start to bore down into it, it's easy to mock it, but if we take it seriously for a moment and the presuppositions of the world that, that, or the views that form this way of looking at the world, actually, I think Greta and the young environmentalists are too optimistic. I don't know that they're depressed enough if you take into account the fullness of what it is that exactly we're up against. And it starts off like this. There's that phrase, you've stolen our future from us. And so we need the adults to take care of this and to do something about it. Have you noticed we're not good at taking care of ourselves, much less the future? A million people are going to die in America this year from totally pre preventable diseases from stuff that they know and that we know will kill them. People watching this will die from stuff that they know in advance will kill them. For do we're, we don't think long term for the next generation. We don't even think long term for our own lives in that way. And then when you start throwing in stuff of the way that we treat each other, uh, abortions, federal debt, all sorts of stuff, does this really look like a culture that's like, really, woo, next generation, let's set them up for the best. Um, push into that a little bit and see if that just helps you stay, uh, sleep well at night. And so if you put your hope in humanity's collective ability to pull ourselves together and prevent some sort of future outcome, it's easy to see how despair could quickly become a part of the way that you see the world. It's, I'm not agreeing with the premise there, but I'm trying to make the connection there that you could see how despair and a desire for hope is the future of that. Hope is the key language there. And what's better yet is it's in terms of salvation. Save the planet. The earth is going to burn. Actually, that's a whole lot more Billy Graham-ish there than <laughs> Billy Graham is, um, of you're scaring children. Well, it's salvation language. Save the planet. Who's the savior? We are. It's in salvific terms. And I think that when you look at it at that level, then the situation gets even worse. And then you start looking at some of the more modern, uh, what would make the headlines. And this isn't true of, of, of real environmental interest, but the popular stuff that comes through the news is it's about... Um, Vote for people who will make a change and, sh and share this video on social media. Um, don't plant a tree. Donate money to people who will plant a tree. And again, you can see this offsetting of putting it into a category of it's somebody else's responsibility to do that thing. And so collect the idea that collectively we'll fix it, just based off of the data of a couple thousand years of human history, 
getting everybody in the world to agree to something and then change their behavior now based off of something that will happen in the future, we don't have good evidence of that. Strike one. Then within that, the government will fix it. And I don't care where you're at on the scheme politically, this is probably not also one that you want to, you know, put your full weight of your hope on that situation. Um, will the market fix it? Actually, that's a fascinating uh, conversation. If you look at epa.gov, if you look at U their uh, report on uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S., you actually see um, an increase in the U.S. GDP, an increase in the U.S. population, and a decrease in our carbon emissions through 2018, and a larger decrease in our carbon emissions per capita. As technology and capitalism combine to reduce some of our use of certain elements. Now, the argument there is, and there are books written about this, of whether or not that trend is there because we're actually offsetting some of our pollution internationally and how that gets factored into it. But there's a case to be made. For example, how many of you have a landline telephone? All right, one person. Um, who carries a calculator, a separate GPS? Um, and you start looking at all the things that just your phone does, that's like 15 devices that you no longer need because it's all in one. And so you're not buying all these extra. So there's some interesting ways in which technology might be able to help us out in that. On the other hand, technology also allows us to hide stuff that we don't want to see. My brother was talking about getting his family's picture taken and their little boy screaming bloody murder the whole time. And so then you're trying to like quick get a picture of him not crying and then you scroll through 5,000 of them, and you're like, oh, there's one where, and he said, well, it was interesting, we were using technology to find the picture of, that didn't match reality. We were finding the picture that was the world the way we wanted to see it, not the way that it actually was. And so technology also allows us to distract ourselves and to put the consequences of our actions some other place. If you threw all of your garbage in your front yard, that's, you would make a change, but I bet a lot of you have traveled to places in the world where basically that's, there's not a, a technology system for concentrated pollution, our landfill system. Um, we have the technology to take that out of our sight. We don't have to see that. And so technology in some ways can help alleviate some of these things, and in other ways it helps us uh, hide some of what we don't want to see. Then on top of that, it's not entirely clear uh, as far as global consensus goes that we know exactly what all the problems even are and then even less what the roots of the problems really are. Then you add on top of that the fact that you have to have some level of economic stability to even care about these things. I talked to a guy once who said, you know what, when I was a young man, all of us who were strip mining coal, none of us thought that was a great idea, but where we lived, it was either do that or nothing, and we chose to feed our families. Those types of things are, are real. You have to have a certain level of, of affluence to even be able to care about some of these issues. And so there's an economic justice element in part in question to this too, that we have to be careful as how we steward that as we speak about this around the world. So are we going to be able to fix the problem from within, uh, collectively, from the government, from technology? Uh, I don't think so. Then there's a second bigger problem that I have, and it's this one, is that the whole idea of save the planet is, a, is definitely a moral prescript. You should do this. That's a call to moral action. Save the planet. What we don't have is a clear definition of why. Why should I save the planet? And this is where you start to run into some problems if, with your strict naturalism. If it is simply just random chance, there isn't an intrinsic value to it. It's like, hey, I live in a country where I can pollute and get away with it. Um, it is what it is, people. And so there's some interesting things to think about in that category, but... Partly what we're saying the reason for environmental destruction is is that it's inherently anthropocentric. It focuses on humanity. And if you go back, this really came to light in the like, 1967 Lynn White's article in Science Magazine, The Root of Our Ecological Crisis, where he says, Christianity gives us the tools to do science, and then science gives us a materialistic way of the world that allows us to exploit it, and then you combine that with Christianity's inherently uh, anthropocentric posture, and that's what causes our destruction. People usually start, stop there without reading to the end of the article where he's saying basically we need a different theological construct to get us out of this, not a different uh, program of some other sort. Now, I would disagree with him that Christianity is inherently the most anthropocentric um, religion of the world. There's room to push into that and challenge that assumption. But that idea is in there is that it's all about us. But on, and that's the cause of the problem. However, on the other hand, if you say, well, do it for the children, save the planet for the children, save the planet for the next generation, save the planet for the other people, save the planet for our future selves, save the planet for our future buildings, who's it about? Us. And so it's hard to escape the conclusion that the modern environmental movement is inherently anthropocentric 
while telling us that anthropocentrism is the cause of environmental destruction. And I'm not saying that's insurmountable, but there's just a general framework there that's worth thinking through of why is it that I should save the planet? And then push back into that. Now, it's true that when you look at the New Testament, the New Testament has a very low view of the world. But when you look at what is actually being said there, it's not a low view of the world as, a, as, a, as far as like the atoms of the world and the physical earth. It's a, it's a critique of the world's value system of materialism and exploitation and using other people and abuse and lust and sin. That's what it's talking about when it talks about the low view of the world and those who friendship with the world is enmity toward God, not that God doesn't love his creation. So there's that system in there. And all of this then is it's easy to critique one system, but you have to propose your own solution to the system if you're going to have a really a robust conversation around a critique. We have to model an alternative there. And the thing that I'm putting my finger on is saying that we have a difficult time grounding morality in the ground. What is our morality based off of? You can't ground morality in the ground and come up with a coherent system that everybody in the world can agree upon. So if we flip that around then and say, well, what is the Christian foundation for seeing moral action as far as it relates to the physical world as God created it around us. I thought what I would do is plagiarize Ravi here a little bit. Many of you have heard his uh, moral law and moral law giver type language back and forth of why do you need a, a moral law giver in order to have a moral law. And so I thought I would just swap out some parts there and see if this fits. Because oftentimes what happens when we're talking about this is we almost talk about humanity as if it's a totally different thing from nature. If we just got all the humans off the planet, everything would be perfect, right? So we see ourselves as separate from nature uh, in order to fix it. On the other hand, we're very much embedded within it, and then Christian theology does give us a unique perspective from within it. And so let me try this on you from, for size um, and just imagine Ravi saying it and me putting some words in his mouth there. So it would go like this. It starts with the problem of environmental destruction. When you assume environmental destruction, you assume there is a proper environmental order. And when you assume a proper environmental order, you assume an environmental order-er. Interestingly, when you raise the problem of creation care, it is either raised by a human in the environment or about humanity's impact on the environment, which means that when the question is raised, it assumes the intrinsic worth of the place of humanity within the environment. If there is no intrinsic worth to humanity's role in the environment, the question actually self-destructs. The environmental value is only justified if it is the creation of a distinct person with a distinct worth, which is God himself. And so the Christian response to this is the ethos is to put the value of the planet back in whose it is. The earth is the Lord's. Why is it his? Because he made it. It's his. That's where it starts. That's, it, God is of intrinsic value. The earth is of value because it's a value to God. And then we are of value because we're of value to God. Same situation there in that he puts us in that. And so when we say save the planet and we ask why, uh, Oz Guinness's spin of Nietzsche's little phrase is he who has no why has no how. If we don't know why we're saving the planet, we're certainly not going to know how we're supposed to save the planet. As we link this justice idea into this then, and there's a little syllogism that Steve Garber, who taught a lot of interns and young people in DC, and he wrote about this, this in his book, Visions of Vocation, that he would see so many people passionate about justice and politics come into DC, and he said, in the city, choose them up and spits them out, and in a few years, they leave disenfranchised with the concept of justice being a real thing and recognize, hey, this is all about money and power, and this is dead, and so he would put this up there for them, and I've used this different times at different universities, just to throw this up on the board and say, hey, let's discuss this. And so the idea here is th simple. Justice is an ideal. And you answer true or false to that. Ideals are utopian and unrealistic. Justice is utopian and unrealistic. And this is a fun thing. I've scribbled this on the whiteboard at numerous universities, like, let's talk about this. Where do you think... Where do you think this breaks down? And I do think there are places where this breaks down, just to be clear, but it's a fascinating way to start talking about it. What does it mean to have an ideal? And can we reach that? And how do we speak into that? And part of it is, is that when we start looking into the actual problems of the world, it's harder to separate ourselves out of the system that we see to be unjust. And so um, just a couple pictures here. This one's from a BBC Future article called The Dystopian Lake Filled by the World's Tech Lust. You see the lake there? This is the runoff from the process of making touchscreens. And in the article, the guy who took the picture, um, Tim Morgan there, talks about how weird it was to take that picture on a device with a touchscreen. 
And probably those of you sitting here tonight have a touch screen in your pocket. And if you're watching online, you're probably watching on something that is implicit, complicit in this. Does that look like your view of, and you don't have to, and carbon emissions, all of that aside, does that look like a healthy ecosystem to you? But what's the balance? What's the trade-off? Is it worth it? You can't really virtue signal about how environmentally woke you are on social media using a device that has this as a runoff from it. I mean, maybe you can, but part of what I want to do with the way that I live my life is not to act like I can live harmlessly. I can't. I just want to recognize the fullness of the impact and the cause and the effect that I have on the world around me. And that makes a difference. And there's, there are certainly ways that you can spin it and make stuff um, sound great. And then there's the reality side of it. On the spin side of it, I woke up this morning, took a shower with a bar of soap that I made, ate a bowl of oats that I grew, put honey in my tea from the bees that I keep, composted my tea bag, put it in a reusable container, which I drank my tea on the way to the airport and then filled it up with water. So I skipped the plastic water bottle in the airplane service um, and on and on, wearing my one pair of brown shoes, a shirt my sister-in-law made for me for Christmas. Don't use a ton of disposable razors. That might surprise you. Um, you know, you can go on and on of looking at like, well, here's the ways that I'm doing. No, I did none of those because I think there's an ecological crisis. All of those are a byproduct of some other interest and relationship that I have. And the byproduct of that is something that later in life I found out was actually a cool thing to do. Um, but it's about the consequences. What is it that we're doing? And do we recognize what comes out of the other side of that? Or the next picture, for example, this is one in Rolling Stone called Planet Plastic. Look at that. They talk about the tons and tons of plastic that we're putting into the ocean and into the ground. I mean, you get a size, sense of the scale there? And we're living in a time in which our recycling system has largely collapsed. And you're, some of you are probably watching this from a city who is now burning their plastic uh, and <laughs> energy production that's actually less efficient and clean than coal um, because we don't know what to do. We can't find other countries to offload this onto anymore. And so it's just the reality of that. A fun book that I like, it's not intentionally theological, is called Garbology, America's Dirty Love Affair with Trash. Um, a fun little read there sometime for you, which says, you know what, basically when you die, there's the size of your gravesite and then 1,100 other ones that are full of the things that you've used in your life. It's interesting to me, maybe there's a side theological talk here, that humans are the only ones that can, can produce things that nothing else can use. All other animals, they decompose, everything else that they produce is, totally goes back into the system, and we alone come up with styrofoam. Uh, it's, pr it's pretty amazing on one hand. On the other hand, you're like, man, if Jesus had been like a plastic mold injector instead of a carpenter, we'd still have some of his stuff around. It'd be awesome. Um, no, so what, what does that say about us, that we can manipulate reality in this way? And is this good, and is this pleasing to God, is a question we have to ask ourselves as Christians. And so it's not a a guilt trip of any sense, but I think we have to know what the reality is. We can use technology to look into this and see, here's part of the, the consequence of that thing that I throw into this that then disappears from my sight, actually does go to a place. We don't believe in magic, it doesn't disappear. But giving money to people to plant trees isn't going to solve that. It might be surprising, some, it's old, old news now, but you live in a world where, you know, in America at least, Barna says that uh, young people rate not recycling as more immoral than viewing porn. Um, this is a huge, maybe this isn't a big issue for you, but for a significant percentage of the people in your life and in the world that you live around, it is huge. Uh, if you're having a church cover dish dinner and you serve that on styrofoam, the people in your congregation under 30 are going to notice. Do with that what you will. So there's this, there's this weariness of the world, um, and I guess a question of what is it that will save us? Is this the trajectory of the future? And what exactly do we need to be saved from? And my question is, is what if these are issues that are deeper in humanity than plastic? What if the problem isn't about what's in your cupboard or your dumpster or your garage? What if it's an issue that starts in your heart? What if there's a deeper thing here? And as Christians, we really do believe that justice will happen. And we're kind of looking forward to it because we recognize precisely the fact that we can't sort this out on our own. Justice will happen. Now, people often say, well, where is God? And this was answered in 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're like, hey, why hasn't God shown up to give us justice? And the author there says, well, it's because God is, is, is delaying his justice in order to allow more people to come into repentance and relationship with him. 
Justice delayed is not justice denied. And in fact, the delay of justice is necessary for the reality of forgiveness. God withholds his punishment and gives us time to repent and come back into relationship with him. If he <laughs> exacted justice immediately, we probably wouldn't have made it to, we wouldn't have made it to this point in the day. Um, that's how it works. But there is a justice that is coming. And as Christians, we, we aren't surprised by that system. We believe that there is a creator, that justice will happen, that it's above us. And so on one hand, we recognize that we are not the saviors of the world, but simultaneously the rest of the sentences, and this is where Christianity is beautiful to me, is that there's a, a and part to that. We are not the saviors of the world, but we have real responsibilities. It's called discipleship, something that Jesus mentioned once or twice. And we get ourselves in this challenging thing where you can actually be so theologically conservative that you start to appear politically liberal in a weird way. And if you think about it and you look at what is the first task that God asked of his people in Genesis is to care for his earth. That's pretty far back. And as far as I can tell, the study of biblical manuscripts shows that the Democrats didn't get in there and edit the Bible to make it look like God cared. God cared before Al Gore. And that he calls us into what Stock calls this level of cooperation. And I think that part of doing that is by saying, what is it? Do we truly understand it? I think it's significant that God had Adam name the animals and know something about them and speak about them. And we know way less about nature than we think. I was walking down the street once, this little girl was like two years old, and there was a rhododendron in bloom. And she said, look, daddy, a rhododendron. And everybody on the sidewalk was like, oh, that's amazing. That child knows the name of a flower. And I was like, that is interesting. But if that kid had been like, well, here are the name of 50 Pokemon, nobody would have batted an eye. That would have been totally normal. And so the unnatural state of nature is sort of amusing to me of do we know how it works well enough that we can actually say, hey, this proposal would make a difference. This is actually how that works. Here's what's really going on. And then I think there's a stewardship of the time that we have. When you look at the United States right now, one, somewhere around 1.5% of the population grows all of our food. And that's heralded as a modern miracle, that it frees the rest of us up to be, you know, cure cancer or watch Netflix. I, you know, so what are you doing with your free time? At no point in human history have we had this much time that we didn't have to put into producing our food. And I could give a whole nother talk on agriculture on this one here. But um, am I stewarding well that time that I have that my forefathers didn't? What's going on here? And so my hope as a Christian is in the future, but my work and my responsibilities are now, and it's based off of what I know will be. The blessed hope does not negate discipleship. And so what I'm pushing us toward here is that if this is truly a justice issue, and we look at something like the civil rights movement, and that sounds weird to even try to kind of make that comparison in the same way, but what Martin Luther King Jr. was able to do was appeal to a moral conscience of a people, of a foundational morality that he knew that they had that they were being inconsistent with and call them to be consistent. And what I'm saying here is we don't have that same moral consciousness to appeal to in a secular society that gives me a justification for real action on this issue. We don't have the tools within our closed system to pull this off. We're gonna need something from beyond. And part of, I guess, some of my way of thinking about this does come from the way in which, and probably same for you, you're raised in the communities that you live in and the way you engage the world. Uh, last month, I came home from church and I wrote down a list of the conversations that I had with people after church. So you know how it goes, after church, everybody's hanging out and chatting. Here are the conversations that I had. Theories of atonement, wheat germination rates, and the possibility of vacuum harvesting crimson clover seed, text critical issues in Matthew 17, proper lettuce planting, seeding, and spacing, art in the Vatican, the average number of drones in a healthy bee colony, the unforgivable sin as a state of being, composting, and the upcoming church book club. <laughs> Man, I love my church. Anybody want to go to church with me? Church is a place where we engage reality, but it's also the place where I engage with people who are older and wiser and have lived in an actual place and who know a place well and say, this is about to bloom because this is when that happens. And there's a memory and a knowledge and an understanding and a participation that comes from living in a place. This fall, I was walking through a section of woods that my grandpa who's now 88 bought when he was 16 years old. And it's a beautiful forest. And we were going through the trees and there were some monstrous trees in there. I mean, just beautiful. And we stood there in the sunlight and he said, this is funny. He said, when I was 10 years old, I stood here with my grandfather who logged this forest. 
And he said, I came along as a little boy and I said, Grandpa, you missed all of the biggest and the prettiest trees. And he said, no, I didn't miss the biggest and the prettiest trees. I left those trees because those are the trees that will reseed the forest for the people coming after me. And then when my kids go through there, they're benefiting from a decision that somebody made five generations before them. And so we don't live in place in the same way that we used to. How many of you think about, well, I really need to take care of my apartment, so five generations from now, you know, the linoleum looks great. You know, it's, we, we live in a different way, but there is something beautiful about that way of thinking of taking what we need, not what we can take, in order to build the schools and the churches and the houses that we need for our community, but to be thoughtful about the future of what our actions are going to have into the long term and how that spools out. I think as Christians, we ought to be able to think in big pictures and broad brushes like that of saying, the decisions that I make today have these consequences on the other side of the world and into the future uh, far more than I can see. I think there are certain things here that if we want to be consistent about this as Christians, we can't say, hey, we just need to take care of the earth. There's a whole other talk that we should give on taking care of our bodies, our physical bodies, and being good stewards of those. I get a kick out of the argument about plastic straws or paper straws. And like, well, I'm righteous because I'm drinking this out of a paper straw. Well, the thing you're drinking will kill you. <laughs> so how is that a special thing? Like that is like 18 times the sugar volume that any human should have in a day. Um, but we're focused on the straw. And I'm not saying we shouldn't think about those things, but like it's in the context where it almost justifies the action because I'm thinking about my straw. Well, think about the whole, the, the totality of the system. As Christians, we ought to be able to people who could do that. And so I think that the way that if there really is a creator in the system, which I believe that there is, that there ought to be kind of this threefold trajectory of ways in which we work this out, that start with there being an operative way in which we were created to function with nature that's actually enjoyable to us. That there's a pleasure of participating in the world in the way that God made it. There's an enjoyment that comes to it. People really change, rarely change their behavior if they don't like it. Uh, guilt only works so far. If you're an environmentalist and you're going the guilt option, talk to the church, we can give you some counsel on that. But um, the enjoyment factor of it, that it really is fun to do some of these things. Then the second part of that is that there's a certain economic efficiency the population of the earth, the way that the world works, none of this is a surprise to God who created a world that we could all fit in and live in if we did it properly. There's an economic efficiency to it. And then the byproduct of those systems is that it has a low environmental consequence to it. And so the way that I see this working practically is that really if we're walking in step with the spirit of God, that what we're really coming to is a place where we're saying that doing things God ways actually is a lot of fun. It's a, it's a steady and a stable way of living life. It's not manipulating, it's not maniacal, it's not based off of guilt, it's based off of a, a, a joyful and loving obedience. And it's the way that God made us to function. And I think in doing so, there will be an economic efficiency to it in a way that uses the resources in the best possible way that they can be used. And it's amazing that God has hidden things in our earth for us that have showed up to fuel our uh, ideas at various points in time. And then as a byproduct of that, that there would be an environmental benefit to it that comes from that. And so when I started off talking about all the random things that I do that some people would say if I cared at all about what's trendy, uh, those are great environmental things. Well, actually, it's just easier for me to compost my tea bag than to throw it away. And I keep bees because I think they're interesting. And I grew oats because I thought that would just kind of be a fun thing to do. And I had fun doing it with my family. And, you know, and the environmental part comes after that and flows from that. But that isn't the starting point. That isn't the focus. I can't aim for it and get there. It has to be the byproduct of something else. I guess I particularly lament the despair that doesn't need to be there in the world on this topic. Uh, last, I guess back in the fall, I was speaking in Canada, and twice on the same day, two different people came up to me and told me that they had heard people in hospitals apologize to their children when they were born. I'm so sorry that I brought you into this world. <laughs> Is that not just a little bit soul-crushing to you? To think that that would be your level of despair. And when they told me that, I just flashed. I remember when my daughter was born, the very first words that I said to her were, welcome to this world. I have so many wonderful things to show you. An optimism about a hope about what is coming. It's interesting that when we take these passages like uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, and it talk about, talks about God returning and there being fire and the elements being melted away and everything laid bare before God, that God's going to see it all and judge it all. And it's just going to be earth and humanity left before him and he's going to decide, then the follow-up verse says, therefore, what type of people ought you to be? And it's a call to holiness. And in Psalm 24, there's that idea that 
Um, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There's that whole part. And then it goes right into, and who may ascend to his holy hill? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol. And so it goes from the physical beauty of the earth into this vision of righteousness. Listen to what it says here in verse um, 13 of 2 Peter chapter 3. It talks about this, this judgment, this refining fire when God just burns up all the ridiculousness and it's us on earth before God. And he's like, what are you guys doing? And then it says this, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Other translations put it, the place where righteousness dwells. That's justice. We're talking about justice, the place where justice dwells in a society on earth that will be established by God. You want social justice? This is it. Not justice that a society decides what's just, but a just society because there's a just God who makes it so. That is a real thing that is going to happen. That is the future of the earth. The God who created it is the God who will redeem it and the God who judges it and the God who restores it. Behold, I make all things new, says Jesus. But I think the question there then is if we stand before God and it's the place where righteousness dwells, do you fit there? Are you righteous? Are you gonna be able to stand before God and be like, look how awesome I am. I composted my socks. Um, probably not. That's not going to impress him. And so the theme over and over here again is in the salvation narrative of our spiritual body, souls and the physical resurrection of them is the same, that God is the one who does the doing. It's all for his glory. He is the one who makes us righteous. He is the one who puts us back together. And knowing that there's a, a, a future destruction and turmoil doesn't change my obligation now. Knowing that my body will heal itself doesn't mean I stab myself. It's a gift given to me by God to steward well, and I'll have to give an account for that. And so there's an invitation here to us that I think in the depth of our despair on the possibility of environmental justice is to recognize, you know, we're not going to pull it off. But I have real things that I need to do in my life as a follower of Jesus. So I want everything to be in conformity to the plan that he has for me. And I fall short of that. That's actually the gospel message is we're not going to be able to sort ourselves out. No government, community, technology, market system will in the end preserve us all. But there is a God who will. And it doesn't allow us to take our hands off the wheel, but to step deeply into a, a deep cooperation and participation with God in the way that he made it. And so I think we find ourselves in these situations that seem overwhelming because <laughs> they're, they're overwhelming. That's why they seem overwhelming. And we call out, God help us. And he is the one. Christ deeply affirms the goodness of creation when he steps into it in a physical way. And as people who believe in a physical resurrection, these things are linked together in an intimate way. And that's the invitation for us is to come back into relationship with God and dwell in the home of righteousness. You want social justice? The reason you long for that is because it actually exists. It's a real thing. It's just that we won't be able to get ourselves there. God is the one who does the doing and invites us into that. And that is the invitation of Christ. And when we posture our hearts in that way, beautiful things come from it. It's about the time of night where I guess my kids are kneeling down to say their bedtime prayers. And kids learn to pray from their parents in some ways, but I know my son, because he usually prays this way, will kneel and say, thank you, Lord, for this day. And for the animals. And for all the other things that you made. And then he says a line that cracks me up. He says, and I ask that you give everybody on this half of the world a good night's sleep. Which is very important, because you don't want a good night's sleep for the people in the other half of the world where it's daytime. And I ask that you give all the people in this half of the world a good night's sleep so that we would have the energy to jump up and explore your world tomorrow. And that's how I want to raise my son, who knows that there's a God who lives as his dependent, who recognizes that it's all his and it's all good, and that it is a world worth exploring, who's cognizant of how the world works, <laughs> spins, who's cognizant that there are people on the other side of the world that his actions impact, but cognizant of the fact that they all belong to God and can live with a deep joy in his heart looking at our world. And that's the invitation that's for you and for me as we grow in the direction that Christ has for us. And that is the place where we find true justice. Amen. Well, I'll invite uh, Sean and Xander to come back up. And then uh, I would say there are questions popping in here already for us. And so we'll, we'll handle those as they come along. But thank you guys. Great. If you're online, you could still uh, go to pigeonhole.at. And again, that passcode is TQ0313. TQ0313. If I got that wrong, uh, make sure you put it up here. But I think it's right. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Nathan. Um, 
a lot to keep up with there. Mm-hmm. And I think even just what you were, there's a lot of questions that I have for myself. There's a ton of questions that have come in. Uh, before we go to the question that I currently have up there, I want to first ask you the question around this idea that consumerism and materialism, uh, it's something you touched on a little bit yeah. here. I'd love you to kind of unpack a little bit more about the implications of that and the environment, how they, the interplay between those. Yeah, so first let me start on the, on the spiritual aspect of that. Um, and I think there's a talk that I gave in Canada uh, entitled Creation Care and a Culture of Consumerism that I think we're going to try to make available online um, in a little bit too. But I think the fundamental thing with consumerism is that it says that the end goal of production is me. So this thing was created for me. And so I think that actually consumerism and materialism is the opposite of worship. Because worship is about saying all of this is, belongs to God and it's a way that I cultivate and steward that and it's ultimately for God's glory, not for me. And so that consumeristic and materialistic mindset elevates humanity into a position where if it's all about me, then it doesn't matter what my um, purchasing choices do or my excess or my uh, neglect does to anybody else. So I think fundamentally it's an issue of the heart of who is this all about? Um, and so I would see it um, starting at that issue of, is, is the world about God's? If it says all things are created by him and for him, referencing Jesus, um, it's kind of hard to see how some of the things that we have were made for Jesus, but um, it's, it's about him, not about me. And so that changes the way in which I purchase things. It changes the way in which I source the things that I purchase. It changes the way that I think about um, what's going to happen to the thing after I purchase also. So recognizing it's not about me, I think is the, one of the foundational points of humility that Christ's life models for us. And that's the starting point on that. Yeah, that's great. I'm, <clears throat> I'm originally from Portland, Oregon, mm-hmm. uh, born and raised there. When I, whatever I move, I tend to have my recycle bin much more full than my, um, garbage bin is something yeah. that you kind of learn in, in Portland at a very young age. But I gotta tell you, you were a hipster before any, <laughs> any, any of the hipsters moved out to Portland. Yeah. I, I think you. I think my friends would really like to. You could go out and give them a huge, huge <laughs> challenge on before so, they put on their red and black plaid shirt and yeah, that's right. Out. You were you were composting your. I can re- I can ride a bike and drink out of a mason jar. Yeah, <laughs> true. Um, one thing about recycling, though, I think even though there's some inefficiencies in our system right now, it's still something worth investing in. Just like cancer research, they don't all work out but the trajectory of where they're going is for a good cause, and so it's something worth doing. I'm glad, um, you, I'm so, glad you say that, because yeah. sometimes I've heard people say, well, it's especially in yeah. light of the current situation, like, mm-hmm. well, it's just all going, you know, yeah. it's not being taken by China anymore, like all the different political things mm-hmm. that come in, but it's almost like this, let's throw our hands up. Right, um, yeah, but I think there's also a role there too, is I actually don't recycle that much stuff, because I don't buy that much single-use stuff. Mm. And so there's, sometimes I think we justify our purchase by, oh, it's recyclable. Yeah. <laughs> well, whether or not it actually does. And so that's worth thinking through too in some of those Yeah, details. I don't know about people sitting here or you online, but um, I was convicted multiple times throughout that talk and I'm just getting more. So thanks. Yeah, well. That's good. No. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's get to the questions online. I want to go to this first one from Alejandro. It says, how would you respond to those within the faith, Christianity, I'm assuming, that we shouldn't care that much about creation care because God will renew all things. And I think that's actually linked to another one. Um, how does environmental justice play a role in eschatology? It's, is it worth pursuing? Sadly, many Christians are the first to say, well, it's all going to end anyways as an excuse to be apathetic. Can we go first? I'm just, gonna, you are, just so you guys know, I'm going to throw the questions out yeah. and kind of let them Xander took um, a go big breath it. there, so she'll go first and then I'll jump in. Not so much breath as a heavy sigh. Um, yeah, I've... I've encountered this thought uh, many times. <laughs> I remember being in a church one time. Uh, it was a new church I was visiting, and uh, I was meeting someone there in the congregation for the first time. They said, oh, what are you doing? What are you studying? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm studying conservation biology. And he kind of looked at me strangely, and he said, that's an interesting career choice. I mean, haven't you read the Bible? I mean, God's going to restore everything. So why are you wasting your time doing it now? Um, so this is definitely a thought that's out there. Um, and I'd like to say right off the bat, I think it's pretty clear which side of the issue I personally fall in because of my career choice. But I, I want to actually start with, with an example. Let's say that um, I'm with my friend. We're going about our day. And someone comes up to her and says some really offensive, terrible, rude thing to her and then walks away. And my friend begins to weep. And I say to her, 
oh, honey, I'm, you know, I would take the time to comfort you and console you, but Jesus is going to come back someday and restore all broken hearts and make all things right. So I'm not really going to waste my time with that. Let's just get on and go get coffee. No, <laughs> I'm, I, I, it would be ludicrous, ludicrous to say that, right? But, and yet we approach the environment in this way. And we approach the natural world when we see um, the damage that's being done. Why would we step back and say, well, I'm not going to worry about that because all things will uh, be renewed. I really love the the picture that Paul paints for us in the New Testament when he describes us as co-laborers with Christ, where this coming of heaven to earth is starting now. Restoration is starting now, not just in the human heart, but also in the natural world. And I think how precious nature is to God. Um, we can learn about how precious it is, it, it is when we read through the scriptures. Uh, and I don't think that the picture that we see in Revelation is one of just being apathetic and throwing our hands up and saying, no, it doesn't matter. All of creation is groaning in expectation, waiting for this time to be restored. And we as Christians have the privilege in taking part in that. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think she's speaking anything. to that cooperation language yeah. there. Uh, and I, th I think maybe if we're looking at this, one thing to do is to go back through and say, um, am I sure that this is what Christianity teaches about the future? The renewal is there, but is it really, is it about, I think when John Stott wrote this, he said, is it about being a Christian or about being a disciple? And if it's about being a Christian where I just say, I believe in Jesus and I do whatever I want for 70 years and then I'm dead and all things are renewed, that's, that would fit well with this. But if God actually does have things for us to do, to reflect his character in such a way that our actions give glory to God, that's how Jesus lived. He did awesome stuff and people praised the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. He was able to do that. Um, and if God has real things for us to do and our decisions really do make a difference in the world, and he allows us to do that. He can do everything better by himself without us. He certainly doesn't need me, but he invites me into that. Um, that this, doesn't, this view doesn't take into view a, I don't think an adequate view of discipleship. And I also don't think it has a full understanding of the value of the physical world. God said it was very good when he put humanity in it. He said it was good before that, but it was complete with us in it in a way that values the physical. We believe in a physical resurrection and a physical earth and a continuity between our physical bodies and the physical ones to come. And so I would never say, well, my kids are going to die someday, so I'll stop feeding them. Um, that's actually not for me to decide. <laughs> that's a terrible choice anyway, but it's how, what is the heart of God and how how does God look at it becomes the foundation for the way that I ought to look at it. And so we see the heart of God toward his creation all throughout scripture. And then obviously the reaffirmation of Jesus coming back in. And so saying just because it will be destroyed um, means I can do what I want with it. I think that's, that doesn't logically follow from that. If we have a full view of a discipleship and the goodness of the physical earth and what God has intended for us to do while we're here. Mm. Yeah, that, very helpful. Thank you guys. Okay, let's take the next question here with 13 votes. It says, how would you respond to the secularists who say that humanity is a cancer to the earth and that nature would be better off without us? Says who? So, yeah, so, I'm, so it's <laughs> no, a question, I mean, so it's asked by a human about, it. so I think the, the, the flaw here in this one, both from a theological and from a environmental naturalistic way of viewing the world is that humanity isn't distinct from the earth. We, we are in some ways, uh, from dust to dust, I often like to introduce myself as a carbon-based life form made in the image of God. Um, I think it gets that balance there of that we are a part of the system in some ways, that we were put here with a, pers with a purpose to be in charge of it, if you want to look at it from a theological perspective. And if you want to look at it from a naturalistic perspective, well, it's accidental that we're here, so you can't use the phrase that it's bad like a cancer, it just is. How do you say what ought to be? It just is. And so if you sense that there's a tension and a difficulty, it makes more sense that that difficulty arises from the fact that there's a uh, environmental order that should be and has been violated, ra violated rather than say, well, just this is the way that it is. It's hard to get to, to an ought from an is, and this question seems to be trying to do that. Mm. It even kind of brings up a little bit of that, um, that what you did with Ravi's Right, the way yeah. you kind of switch that up yeah. is one thing that came to mind. But it's it's that. an idea that's very real. It's not a dumb question at all yeah. because lots of people have that. If we got all, rid of all the humans, everything would be great. And this is actually kind of just yeah. thirty second little thing. This is one of the elements where the whole concept of regenerative agriculture is very fascinating. When they look at not only 
sustainability isn't enough, but is it possible that if, uh, I think as Joel Salatin said, God gave us you know, a lot of gray matter and opposable thumbs, that there would be a way in which we could actually work on the planet. Um, some of these guys asking questions of, of what does that mean to live Christianly? Can we build topsoil with the way that we farm? And can we actually leave the land better than we found it? Would be an, an affront to that line of thinking of saying, actually there is, the, the forests are more healthy when humans are in them. Silviculture is a real thing. It has massive environmental benefits all around the world that's practiced. Um, so again, some of it comes back to looking at the way that the world actually works. And so can humans destroy things? Absolutely. But can we create and build and renew and bring life back to things um, in the environment and plant. And yeah, we can do that too. And so that's a, a fun part of cooperating with God. Yeah, that's good. All right. Um, the next question we'll go with here is 14 votes. It says, our youth are fearful and angry because we are not doing near enough to address climate change and save the planet. Is there scientific evidence to allay their fear? If so, where can we find it? So this is obviously coming from a particular perspective. So feel free to speak yeah. around this in any way you guys uh, f feel for, feel like you want to. Let me just say one one initial thought, and then I'll let Sandra Sandra give the real answer here. Um, one of the things that's fascinating to me, and, and this this might sound a little bit cynical, but the the idea that it's sort of that OK Boomer movement, right? Of like you guys destroyed the world. And, didn't do any, and you're not doing anything about it, so now we're going to have to be in charge of it. Part of the reason is, is that because the adults are up against something called math. Like, there are, there are physical limits and constraints to what we can do physiologically and physically and mathematically and economically that actually your ability to even say that thing has been based off of the economic choices that have gone before you. So it's, I, I don't, it, it's not enough to say, well, you guys failed. Well, this generation isn't up against what that generation was up against. Um, so we can point fingers and blame back and forth there, but I think we have to recognize that there are, are math is a moral issue there. You can't just keep right, we need more money. That's what you always hear. Well, if you know, put more money, that rarely solves the problem. And so there are real physical limits and boundaries to what it is that we can do. Uh, and so I don't see the whole blaming the older generation um, in fact, if you go back two generations, like if you have a grandparent that lived through the depression, their environmental footprint <laughs> is like, I mean, I'm talking about like my grandma saving her butter wrappers to grease her skillet and like not having all the light bulbs screwed in in the bathroom. I mean, it was just the economic way of life. That way of living did not destroy the planet. Um, so to say that the generations who came before us are totally responsible for the situation that we're in, they're responsible in the sense that they lived in that. But let's not say that just because they existed there means that they were directly responsible for the way that everything turned out to be. So um, mm, I don't yeah. think the moral culpability generationally um, is a, an entirely consistent argument. It brings up an interesting uh, term that I think of C.S. Lewis who called chronologi chronological snobbery. snobbery. Yeah. Um, and it's this idea that we could look back on the generations of the past and say, partic make particular judgments about them mm -hmm. based on where we sit. And I, I kind of want to like, in light of the way the world has developed and so f at, the, the, at the pace yeah. that it has developed I, I wish you could somehow like take some people back and be like okay hey, what would you do in this situation right. and I, I'm really challenged to think that, the, that a lot of the decisions would be that much different Well, and there are, thing, there are things that people did in the past that were probably not the best environmentally but they didn't do it maliciously they didn't have the scientific <clears throat> facts to know the consequences of that outcome and so that's a, a bit of a blurring of the distinction when you're blaming in that way too, of saying, well, actually there are things that we're probably doing now, like your smartphone runoff, um, that 20 years from now, people will point to this generation and say, you didn't do enough. So I think the best thing we can do that applies whether you have a 200 square foot apartment or 2,000 acres is to be a faithful steward of what it is that's right in front of you. What does God have for you to be in charge of and handle that well and live there well enough in a way that you find out the way to care for it and to pass that along to the next generation? Um, that should be a, a fun task to do. Um, but I, I don't think, again, we can, we can play the blame game um, and just punt it around the world and make ourselves feel better about it. That's yeah. not, we're not really answering the question here. No, yeah. That's just the heart behind it. Did you have something you want to say about the scientific evidence on this? Um, 
actually also about the heart as well, if I may, just addressing the first part of the question. Um, as I was reading this question, I was remembering a time when I was really young and my brother and I had taken our bikes down to the creek and we liked to go down there and just catch crawdads, you know, because they were so interesting, I weird little that. creatures. The they so were fun. so cool, right? Um, and we would never take them out. We would always put them back in the oh. bike home. Um, they're actually, you know, they're I okay eat to eat, but they're not, oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> when you're a kid, you're usually a picky eater. So, um, but when we were there, uh, one time there were these children that were, um, these two boys, I'll never forget it, that were pulling the crawdads out of the water, and then they were throwing them against the wall of this building and just killing them, one over the other. And they were laughing like it was funny. And it was incredibly disturbing. And... I remember just biking home and having this feeling of, of, of deep sorrow and uh, emptiness. And yet on our way home, you know, we saw this girl walking a puppy and we stopped and we play and it was like instant joy, you know, and we were completely just, you know, fed by, so it was like, you have this one interaction where nature's being abused and then this other interaction where, you know, there's something so beautiful and, and the nurturing of God's creation. And I think it really shows that there is this deep inherent human connection to nature. So I, I just want to um, say it's not wrong to feel bad about what's happening to our natural world. I think it's very appropriate to feel upset, to feel sorrow, um, even to feel a bit of anger. What we do with those emotions, though, is incredibly important. We as, stu as, as Christians are stewards of our emotions, our thoughts, um, and so we have to react in an appropriate way. And um, one thing that I like about the younger generation is a lot of people are coming up with creative ideas on how to change things. And I'm reflecting on Paul's words to Timothy when he says, you know, don't let people look down on you because of your youth, but instead be an example to them. And so I'd like to encourage anyone else out there who, if you're a young person, you're interested in this scientific field and you wanna do more, I just wanna encourage you and say, keep going and keep stepping up and don't let the anger or the fear be debilitating, but be encouraged, uh, be encouraged encouraged at the role that God has for you and keep pursuing that work. Just one more thing to the, the heart of that question is, um, and I don't have the title of it, Forbes magazine had an article a couple months ago that I think was helpful of saying, okay, let's, let's take um, every climate model as totally true and run it to its full logical conclusion. That would change your life, but it's not going to annihilate humanity off the face of the earth. And so there will be a change if all of that comes true but it's not the end of civilization as we know it um, in the same sense. And so I think there's a way in which you can be concerned without being fearful. You can be watchful without worrying um, and be mindful of the fact that even if we assume that all of it will get as bad as it said, humanity will still exist and has through all sorts of different situations in the past. So will it be a change? Yes, but is it um, an existential threat to the human species? Uh, no, and that's coming from an environmental scientist. Uh, if you look in Forbes magazine on, maybe I forget the title of it, of kind of are we overdoing it on the crisis language? I think that can take some of the fear out of it that allows us uh, some of the, the, the smoke to settle and us to think in a more level-headed way about some of these things. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, I know I made that comment, oh, about the crawdads. I didn't do that to them. I, I ate them too. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I found them quite delicious. Um, okay, so moving on. This is a... Uh, sensitive question. I'm yeah. even hesitating bringing it up, but I, I really would love you guys to address this one here. What would you say to people who deny climate change is an issue? Now, there, there's probably someone online who holds one extreme spectrum, the other, and someone who holds the other, even in the room, even with the small amount of people we have here, it might yeah. be that there's people in that different view. How do, how do, you, how do you think about this particular topic? Let me go first and you jump in or you sure. got to think. Um, let's just say here that I think the, um, one of the assumptions in the question is, I don't, there aren't as many people who deny climate change as a cycles in history of the past and the differences that there have been over history and will be in the future. Uh, we believe that climates change. Um, the, the real heart of the question is, is, is in man-made climate change. I think that's the controversial part of that. Um, so I think most everybody says, yeah, there are seasons and cycles and weather events, and, and that is a change that 
I would say most people agree on. Uh, the man-made part of that is a more difficult element. But let me say this as we're looking at that, is that I think one of the things is that, so these are projections based off of climate models. And actually, if you check the weather, you're living based off of a climate model in some ways. You're looking at a, a model, uh, and those are different because they can be repeated in some sense. But it's fascinating to me to look at, I like looking at different weather reports, recognizing that for most geographic regions, uh, the weather stations are all using the same radar data. It's not like they're gathering different data. They're all using the same data and then running that through their different algorithms to produce their forecasts. And some of them are like half an inch of snow and two feet of snow. Like, well, that's fascinating, using the same information to get to those wildly different conclusions. And I think the people who are skeptical there, there's a little bit of rightfulness in that because I've found that the ones that have the craziest predictions have the most advertisements in the margins. So you're like, is it to your benefit to have a wild and crazy weather report because more people are going to click on this page. And so there's a little bit of not just skepticism in that. Um, and then the other one that, uh, so, so I'm not justifying it, but I'm trying to look for kind of causative threads and, and thoughts here. The other one is, is that actually there's a massive um, decline. This is going to sound weird to say in science itself. Like if you look at our generation, the, the level of interest in astrology for telling the future of crystals, like all these things are massively on the rise compared to our parents' generation. And so what science says in some categories isn't really taken seriously in a lot of categories, not just in this one. Um, so I think there is a, one other thing to add onto this is to recognize that science um, doesn't, and this is more of a philosophy of science thing, science doesn't necessarily um, progress in a nice, neat, linear, step-by-step process, it kind of grows as an amorphous blob in the center of mass sort of charts a trajectory of where we're thinking things are going. Even with your different weather forecasts based off of the same data, um, you can get a consensus of the direction that we think the thing is, is moving. So we can get a consensus of the direction that we think the thing is moving. This becomes a question of um, causation and correlation. How is the, I read the full IPCC, it's a massive report on this. I read the Oxford Introduction to Global Warming. Um, and yeah, there are questions about how the things are put together and how samples are taken and how can they be accurate and all this. But there is a, a model that says, look, I don't think there's a, um, at the fundamental core of the science, I don't think there's a clickbait um, scheme going on here. Now, the way that scientific findings are then reported by non-scientists and communicated to scientists is where you get into like airport, airport uh, billboard size font in the headlines of the news. And so my, my suggestion when dealing with this is when you see a claim in the news or a report, always click the link and read the report and what it actually said um, from the beginning, and sometimes we're, I think we say a little bit more than our data can say, and we want to be careful not to do that uh, as scientists, and we want to be careful not to do that as Christians either, but to look at the trajectory of these things and say, are there thoughtful Christian people even who are engaging with this who say, hey, here's a trajectory of a way that we're headed that aren't doing it in a, a politically manipulative um, sociologically hip, but just for the sake of what the science says. And there have been uh, very unfortunate things, I think, in the way that some of the data has been shared and not shared and some of the lawsuits internally. And there's a lot of chaos um, and maybe over defensiveness in some of the voices that are speaking into this that blurs the lines and distinction there a little bit. So I think those would be some uh, fundamental parameters. You're probably not going to... Um, so the question is, what would you say to somebody? Uh, we're not nearly as rational as we like to think we are. And so if somebody has a position on this, um, raw data probably isn't going to be the thing that changes their mind. And so I think you maintain your friendship. Um, you continue to watch the conversation unfold. You take um, the actions that you think are appropriate to your interpretation of it. Um, again, not living in a existential fear of it, but being mindful of the trajectory of some of these things. And some of it is... Um, We'll wait and see. And sometimes there are things that are unknown that you say, even if it, it doesn't turn out to be true, it would be bad enough that it's worth taking precautions now um, to not be complicit or a part of that. So mm -hmm. people will come at different points on that. But yeah. Yeah. actually, before yeah. I still want you to say something on it, Xander, if you'd like. But um, <clears throat> one thing I want to mention here, because there's another question I'll bring into this, and it talks about how this is this is the issue. It, these move around a bit. Um, it says climate change is one of the largest divides between America and America's political parties. How can Christians begin to move forward with peaceful conversation? And one thing that you could learn, um, I think, from Nathan, even just 
not only from his thoroughness, but um, Cameron McAllister and Nathan have a podcast called Thinking Out Loud. I highly suggest um, listening to this. And I think one thing they do there is they look at the world through a lens of Christian hope. And you, you really get to hear how, I think, I think you give a good model there to answer this question of how to talk peacefully about things. Yes, it's between two Christians, but the thing that you guys really do there is the way you're addressing some very, uh, their current issues. A lot of them are quite controversial issues. So I'm sure you get a lot of emails on both sides (laughs) um, saying different things, but share a little bit about that. No, no, I think that's a a great question. And and some of what I was trying to do overall in the talk and and part of the reason that I I dragged Billy Graham into this is is to show that um, deeply, I think these are, these are theological issues, not political ones. And it's at the, I mean, very, when was the last time that your family really got into a fight over Thanksgiving dinner over um, a theological issue? It's, it's politics. This is the, the thing that divides us. And so I, part of what I'm trying to do is saying, okay, yeah, the political thing is interesting, but really this, this is below this. And it's not trying to be sub, you know, um, subversive or anything like that and try to get around and backdoor advocate for some type of political position. I know I, I actually think that this is a, a posture of our heart and it's a theological thing and it matters to God. And so I take the conversation to that level to have it. Um, And then the other thing that I do is sometimes for the sake of uh, conversation is I push totally into the numbers and say, let's say everything that you believe is is completely true. So I went through and calculated up um, carbon emissions from the electricity that my house produces, how many tanks of gas I bought, the whole nine yards, calculated out how many tons of carbon dioxide are absorbed per acre of tree. And when I look at our family, we actually run carbon negative based off of the number of trees. So, okay, so does that mean I get to do whatever I want? Um, so some of it is, is you take it to a theological thing, and then some of it is you take it down to the core of, like, let's assume the numbers are true and then talk about what change would you actually make in your life? What change would I actually make in my life? So there are a number of ways to do that, one being the, the serious one and then the other one being the fun, just kind of hypothetical. Well, let's run with the numbers and talk about what that would actually look like and then how does that change the conversation? Mm. That's great. We can go back if you had anything else you wanted to add on to that. Or we can... Yeah, well, it ties in beautifully to the previous question. So, yeah, I mean, I can certainly speak to this one, too. I, I so appreciate the heart behind this question because, um, it, you know, it's about how can we move forward towards a peaceful conversation about something that's yeah. so polarizing. And being someone who's really interested in climate science, I'm personally not a climate climate scientist, but I do read a lot of the literature, um, you find that there's these two polar extremes. On one side, it seems that people are saying, you know, it's, it's not an issue at all. We're not going to talk about it. It's not even on the table for discussion. And on the other extreme, they're saying, well, we're basically already extinct. It's over. Like, you know, it's, this is it. So um, where, but where, where does the data point? Where does the science point? And I think a big part of this comes back to not only being ambassadors for Christ, but also worshiping God with our minds. We remember that we should worship him with all of our heart and all of our soul, uh, but often we forget how to worship him by thinking well. And I think it's such a gift that we're able to do that. And this is one of those situations when I think it's important to try and exercise that um, and to build into that. I read things all the time that are completely completely scientifically incorrect. Uh, I, the other day I read that um, because of climate change, koalas are functionally extinct. That is absolutely false. That is absolutely false. On the IUCN red list, they're, they're labeled as vulnerable, which is four steps above functionally extinct. Now, does that mean that there are no problems? No, of course there are problems. And as a conservation biologist, I am very interested in finding solutions to the problems. My issue is when we catastrophize something um, so strongly that it becomes the only thing that we see and we forget some of the immediate things like habitat loss, pollution. Um, These are things that we can address right now that everybody basically is agreeing on. And I understand the frustration when you're trying to have a talk with someone about climate change and maybe they say, I don't even wanna talk about it. Yes, that can be frustrating, but there are plenty of other things that we can talk about that have to do with the good stewardship and protection and restoration of this earth. And um, if that's you and you've had those conversations and you feel frustrated, I would encourage you to just change gears and say, okay, fine, let's let's talk about pollution or let's talk about reducing what we use. Um, let's talk about how we're managing our habitat. 
Um, so yeah. That's a great point because you don't have to um, be up and up on the last data of the parts per million of carbon dioxide over Hawaii to say, you know, a lot of plastic in the ocean isn't a good idea. Um, and so bringing it back to that. Also, I was thinking, when we, the first time we met, we had both just read the, the book Rambunctious Garden. Who, who's the author? Do you remember the author of that? Emma Maris. And basically the premise of that book is that there isn't a square foot of the Earth's surface that humans haven't touched and cultivated and harvested and stewarded and burned at some point, I mean, in, in history. And so the human capacity, do I think that humans can change the environment? Yeah, I think that was the, the mandate <laughs> in creation that God gave us the capacity to do that. The question is, do we change it for the better or for the worse? Um, and so, again, it's a, a theological thing. I want to live and act in such a way that I'm being obedient to God. I don't, I don't want to live like, oh, here's a crisis, now I have to change my life. I want to, like, I want to be obedient to God and have the, the, the footprint part of that be a flow from that obedience, not in response to a crisis, but because out of an obedience to a command. Mm. Yeah, good. Thanks, guys. Well, um, I guess before I go to, let me see. I, I kind of want to go to my own question. Um, <laughs> Do it. Just because I'm you up, have the mic. because I'm up here, right? Uh, I one of the things that hasn't been lifted out here. I've been looking for questions that might tie into it a little bit, and I might be missing things because I'm trying to listen to everything you're saying, but I'm also trying to look at the questions um, here. But as we've talked about this, I think one of the things that's come through is sometimes we don't fully understand the implications even of what we're doing now in some of the advances. Like you talked about touch screens and whatnot. And um, I've also had a discussion with you, Zandra, even about you know electric cars and um, solar energy and how this sometimes is promoted as like the next thing that's going to solve all the problems. But you have all, you've also brought up some issues with that uh, that we, that I don't often hear in the discussion. I think this would be the right type of environment to even bring up some of those things. And then you feel free to pitch in as well because you probably have thoughts have on that, thoughts. like you have thoughts on most things. So, <laughs> Valid or not? Eh, but. Yeah. <laughs> right, back to the sad, sorry, dis destructive uh, thoughts here about what we think is actually being constructive but um, could be destructive. So there are lots of good things out there, uh, lots of things that are helping us with clean energy, but we often don't think about the waste. Where is the waste going and how bad is the waste? Um, and there are so many uh, sources of energy such as windmills, right? We were talking about this earlier. Um, where I come from in Colorado, there are whole fields full of windmills. And uh, the sad thing is that they're killing so many birds. Uh, they killed tons and tons of birds. So, you know, that's one concern. That's one thing to think about is how is this source of energy going to benefit us, but also how is it going to impact the natural world? Um, what, what was the You were talking about solar panels, batteries with electric cars. Oh, right. Yes. If we're... Um, we're, you know, we're developing a lot of batteries that are really helpful, that are pretty energy efficient, but then when those things are done being used, we bury them in the ground, and what's, what's the next thing that happens? You know, we have to ask, where is the battery acid going? How does that affect um, the water table and things like that? And which we're just yet to see. Indeed, yes. I mean, we could, do some, they could probably do some studies on it, but I mean, mm -hmm. 100 years down the road, where, where are we? Like, we just don't know. Yeah. yeah same so, way. no, I, th I think it's to that point, though, of... Again, it's not to say that we shouldn't do it. It's to say we need to recognize the consequences of using that technology. So every, every action that we do, it's like you are saying, being thoughtful. I mean, I've, I've often jokingly said, so I live in West Virginia, we get uh, upper 90s percent of our electricity from coal. It's super cheap. Um, so I would love to have an electric car with a powered by coal bumper sticker. I mean, that's the reality where I live. If I had an electric car, it would be powered by coal. Um, and so it kind of, I would do that just because it kind of pokes at that balance of that cause and effect nature of what, so where's it, where's the energy for this thing coming from? Um, and be thoughtful about it. Yeah. So you, I mean, you have the same thing of you say, well, let's use a ceramic coffee cup instead of a paper cup. Well, the amount of energy that it takes to fire that cup is like 11,000 paper cups, you know? So there's a sense in which that doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do, but I think it does kind of pop the bubble of our self-righteousness on some of the actions that we do. And so I have a kind of a low level of empathy for people that get kind of moral high horsey about the choices that they're making without thinking through kind of them. It goes back to, do we understand really the way that the world actually works? And so we need to have that fundamental understanding um, in order to decide what to do next and what not to do next. If I could just jump on that again. Yeah. So just 
um, to add one thing that came to mind as Nathan was speaking. Um, so I realized that maybe some of this discussion could be a bit discouraging because perhaps you're thinking, well, we're doing our best and it's still not good enough. And what does that mean? You know, like just this feeling of being desperate and, you know, what's going to happen when I stand before God and make an account for how I've treated the earth. If I've done things that were wrong that I didn't even know were wrong. And, uh, Earlier today, I was reading in Hosea, Hosea chapter four, verse six, when it says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And then it says, um, but my priests who have rejected knowledge, I will reject them. So there's clearly a distinction and a delineation between having a lack of knowledge and acting out of that and having knowledge and acting against that deliberately. And God's judgment is different on those two things. So just to say that as an encouragement to you, I, I used to have a lot of anxiety around this and think, you know, I'm trying to be as perfect as possible. I'm trying to not hurt the environment, but no matter what I do, it just seems like I'm contributing to the problem. Um, so be encouraged, be encouraged that um, our God is a God who sees the heart as well as the actions. And I think to balance that with, you know, Jesus ate fish and killed trees to make points. Um, so the, there's a difference between <laughs> the, the use of the earth and the abuse of the earth. And so we, we were put in a, in a, in a stewarding and functioning way. And so <laughs> nothing that we're saying is suggesting we shouldn't use it, but we're saying, I, I think this is why, <laughs> if I may, it's so important for us to pray when we eat is to recognize the, with gratitude, everything that went into our daily bread as we're, I mean, it's just a complex system of <laughs> different countries and individuals and people, and it's, and it's glorious um, to think about that type of provision. And so, again, yeah, the, the, the creation is broken in order for us to live. Stuff dies, whether it's a cow or a kale plant, for you to live. I mean, death is part of it. We, we live because of that. Uh, and so, to say that we can live harmlessly is disconnected from reality, but to do that thoughtfully... And with gratitude, I think, changes something about the moral behavior of it, of just even being cognizant of what it is that's necessary for you to live, and that actually turns back into gratitude for a God who created a system that works in such a way. Speaking of kale, um, you, there, was a, there was a meme at one point in time when there was a tornado coming through, like P Portland, when there's a natural disaster, it's like a giant, like, crate of kale, like empty. <laughs> <laughs> they were joking about us Portlanders just <laughs> chewing on kale. kale. But no, there's some questions actually about uh, what we eat and mm -hmm. eth ethical eating yeah. and whatnot. And we've had some interesting conversations on this, Nathan, so I'd love to hear. Um, there's a couple I'm going to tie together. How can we eat in a way that is healthy for us and is taking care of the supply chain and the place and people who make the food available to us? But then I'm also going to put up one that I think is just so interesting mean right interesting to me right now in light of some of the different documentaries, if you can call them fully documentaries, um, out there about this. But should Christians eat meat? What do we say the argument on the meat industry and its perceived negative effects on the environment? Mm -hmm. Can you read the first one? Are those the two? Yeah, so can those are the, the first, two. What was the first one again? The first one, one I'll put up here. Oh, the supply chain and how do we... Supply chain, how do we eat responsibly to the food yeah. and care for the food that's available to us? Yeah, I think there are a number of things there. Um, so my wife and I always used to you know, you have, um, should I eat the conventionally grown strawberries that my neighbor grew, or should I eat the organic ones flown to me from Argentina? You know, so part of it is, is, a, is a educating yourself on what does the label actually mean. And um, I think that goes from how you source your eggs to your yeah, strawberries of looking at like, okay, what, so this says all natural and you're picking this up and it has the picture of the cow out in the field. Like, okay, what's the reality behind that? So some of that I think is just on consumer education. Then I think there's the uh, Mennonite cookbook, Simply in Season. It talks about eating seasonally. Should we be eating apples in April? Uh, depending on where you live, maybe yes, maybe no. And so there's some thoughtfulness there too that I think um, you could place into that of do, do I want to think about how that supply chain. Uh, it's amazing when you start looking at Part of, and part of this comes from living in a consumer culture of um, my wife often looks to point at, likes to point out on a salad, for example, you have cool weather and hot weather crops both in one mix. Like they, nowhere in the world are they growing together at the same time in the same way. Like we rely on like five different countries to put together one dish for us. And so some of it I think just comes from the fun of asking a question, where did this come from? And then, uh, and there's a lot of information online of kind of looking at what do these labels actually mean. Um, 
and I think there are, are tons of, and this transitions in the next one, there are tons of people doing small scale production of, of food, small scale agriculture. Um, now here's the thing, if you're gonna be conscientious about it, uh, it's gonna cost more financially. And so eating the, the local thing that was produced at a small scale in a way that, you, that aligns with your values is going to cost you more money than eating something that was mass produced in a different country six weeks ago and frozen and shipped to you. So I think that would go into the next one about the meat industry too, is um, I think we should be mindful of recognizing that um, I'm okay eating meat with animals that were produced in a way that values them as animals. I'm a little more hesitant um, on the concept of the systems that treat animals like machines. And so I think there's a, a, a distinction there that can be made of, are we valuing the animalness of that animal? Of is it allowed to express what it actually is? And so on one hand, if you look at that and you say, um, let's look at a cow, for example, something that can go out and eat grass its entire life, grass which has zero nutritional benefit to a human and have a wonderful life in a bad five seconds and provide a lot of calories that are quite frankly delicious. And when I look at that and say, well, would I rather have this half, you know, six ounces of beef or a compressed cubic foot of spinach? Yeah, I'll go with the beef. Um, but because, and actually you can graze those in a way that's restoring the land that is on land that shouldn't be tilled. It controls the runoff. Um, so I think part of it is just educating yourself on what are your values on that. And then uh, vote with your wallet on these things. Um, there are people who are out there, now there are some ridiculous ones out there who are happy to sell you a chicken named Susan for $96 that you know wore a sweater their whole life. Um, I don't think you need to go that far. That's not respecting the chicken on the other direction. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, we live in a place where you have a, a market that if, if this is a, a problem for you, look into it and there are, there are legitimate alternatives. Um, and so yeah, I have some my own personal experiences on how I think about some of that stuff, but another time. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm going to ask a, another question here. Well, I will let someone else ask the question. I'll put it up here. Um, within the context of natural disasters, does God act as a divine watchmaker, taking a step back only in circumstances where, sorry, where um, humanity was at fault? Is that still within his sovereignty? Don't feel like you have to answer the whole question there if there's this part you want to pick out because it is a couple questions within All right, I'll, I'll jump in and then we'll let Zandra yeah. do that. Um, a book that I read that wasn't intentionally theological on this that was really interesting for me is by um, a guy named John McPhee who writes a whole lot of different books, but he wrote one called The Control of Nature. And in The Control of Nature, he looks at all of the different ways in which humanity has worked so hard to build systems to circumvent natural effects. And I mean, you could sort of summarize the book in the fact of like, if you build your house on the side of a volcano and then it burns down, can you blame God sort of thing? And just looking at how we build cities now in places that 200 years ago, nobody would pitch a tent or we rechannel rivers or we build out in the coast and peninsulas or we build on, yeah. And just looking at the world history of our kind of the, um, <laughs> the arrogance of man to say, I'm going to stick my face in this. And if it hurts, I'm going to blame God is sort of an interesting, so there's, I think some of that of, if we were <laughs> in step with God, would we necessarily need to be, and he, I mean, fun ones in California, he looks at like um, landslide and home purchase is in California of like, here's a house. Every 50 years, there's a landslide. The landslide comes, knocks the house off. It's gone for five years. Somebody buys it and builds a house in 50 years, the landslide, you know, it's like, there's a pattern here, people. You know, can we blame God for that sort of thing? So that's one of it is just being in tune with nature. The other side of that is, as a comment that Fuzz Rana said recently, as he said, you would not want to live in a world where there weren't hurricanes. And that's kind of a, a striking statement to say, but it is also true that there are deep, um, deep ecological value to some of the, the things that we see as a disaster because of the impact that they have on humanity that would be, um, so for example, and, and this happens differently in different parts, in, in the spring where I live, we get these massively heavy thunderstorms. Um, and sometimes there's flooding from that. But other times what's happening there is all of, the, all of the old and the dead wood from the winter is broken out of the trees. So the new growth can come out and, and flourish in the spring. And so that, that dense, heavy storming rain is necessary for part of the way that the world is meant to replenish and grow and cycle. Um, and so I, I do think that 
um, God works within natural systems, but that the way that he made the world and the complexity of the way that nutrients are cycled by uh, storm forces and the jet stream and all of these are, are wonderfully beautiful things that show the intricacy of a design and the way of sustaining an earth. And so, yes, is there a difficulty then when we get in the way of that? Absolutely. Are there real tragedies? Absolutely. Um, are there causative forces in nature that aren't Good, that's a question Alvin Plantinger has asked, and I think, yeah, that's possible too. Um, and so God can intervene in that. I don't see him as a divine watchmaker who just sets it up, spins the dice, and watches it go. I think that's the beauty of that idea of the Holy Spirit being able to um, work within us. I know people who have been warned of natural disasters by God in dreams and prayer and stuff like that too. So I think there are ways in which um, God works within the system, and it is a good one and I'm less likely to blame. I think there's, there's a balance. There are times in which it's humanity's fault um, because we're at the, the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing. Uh, and, and you see different versions of this. If you cut down all the trees along the coast and then the storm surge takes out the hotel, you, you know, how does that work? Or is that just a misunderstanding of the ecological value of how these things go? So um, I'm kind of giving a, a down the middle of the road there, but recognizing that some of the things that we see as destructive are destructive relative to what we wish they were without taking into the full context of what it is that they're actually doing for balancing temperature and nutrients and different things in our world. Mm -hmm. Did I get that close to right from the meta, <laughs> meta view? Yeah, it sounded great to me. So stamp <laughs> of approval. That's not very Says affirming. the biologist, not my, not my, uh, not my forte. But yeah, I mean, on I guess on the line of of disasters and um, the brokenness that we see in the natural world, this is something that has disturbed me from the time I just started off in biology. You know, you see all sorts of things in the natural world that seem. Uh, very broken, very wrong. And you have to ask, is this, you know, how did this happen? And, um, you know, I think obviously that goes back to the fall, back to Eden and, and the fact that um, when sin entered this world, it affected the natural world. So the Christian narrative is that the natural world as it is now is not how it was meant to be, but one day these things will be put right and I was talking with a friend of mine um, called AJ Roberts, who lives in California. I was messaging her today. Um, she's a virologist. She studies viruses. And we were um, just talking about the fact that the vast majority of viruses are so good and we would not have life on this planet if we didn't have them. We wouldn't have rain on this planet if we didn't have them. Um, our ocean cycles would not be the same and um, we wouldn't be able to exist right without them. And so I said, well, AJ, how many are actually bad? And she said, a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Um, mathematically, they're negligible. But then she said something really interesting. But she said, but every human life that is affected by that um, breaks God's heart. So even though mathematically these things are negligible, when things go bad in nature, they go very, very bad. And um, just to say that, you know, our God is not a God who takes a step back in any circumstance. He is the God who takes a step towards us, especially in times of suffering. The Psalms say that he is near to the brokenhearted, right? He restores the crushed in spirit. And in Jeremiah, um, he says, because the, the heart of my daughter is broken, my heart is also broken. So he's a God of compassion who reaches out to us in times of disaster and distress. And I would just say, that's a great ending to that, that yeah. I, I think in some of these, I don't always know why, but I do know how God asked me to respond to the hurting. Mm -hmm. And so don't let the big question distract you from the practical element of what needs to be done. I don't know why this happened, but I do know what my response is supposed to be. Um, and so I think that maybe then brings it back down to even on the broader theme of, I think that's where I want to live too. I want to be mindful because I'm a disciple of Jesus and I want to bring every thought to conformity and I want to live a life of integrity where all the pieces do fit together in a real way. I want to be mindful of what's going on. And are there big questions? Are there things that are unknown? Absolutely. And some of those are actually really fun yeah. to sit on the cusp of the unknown and see that the, the extents of the mystery that is yet to be discovered and known um, is a beautiful position to be in, recognizing that there will be brokenness, that I'm called to step into that and to help as I can and as God equips me, but to also recognize that there's real hope for the future, that there is a real restoration, and that that posture of hope gives me a real peace in this moment that should allow me as a Christian to be clear-minded and level-headed 
and be in step with the spirit of God as he has uh, what he has for each of us to do in the upcoming days. Yeah. Well said. I think that's a good way to end it. As we do come to a close here then, uh, could you just share each of you, like, because there's, there's questions about resources, practical tips. Like, do you have one book each that you'd suggest to read on this topic and then also like a practical way that you could, someone could implement change? And just, we'll, we'll keep this one quick. Yeah, I have one book and I can't remember the exact title. There's a picture of a blue Morpho butterfly on the cover, so you'll find it easily. Google that. It's, it's written by Alistair McGrath and I believe it's called Reenchanting Nature or The Reenchantment of Nature. And um, in his talk, Nathan mentioned a paper written by Lynn White in the 1960s uh, um, postulating that... Um, Christianity is the cause of our ecological crisis, which is a commonly held belief even today. Sadly, I, I come um, to that. I, I meet people who have that view a lot. But I would encourage you, particularly if you're a young budding biologist or an uh, ecological, eco ecologist or a restorationist, um, to buy this book. It's short. It's easy to read. It's beautifully written. And it will really encourage you um, as you are on your quest. Yeah. I think the, uh, I hesitate to recommend mi many books because a lot of books have bits and pieces that I wouldn't necessarily agree with. Yeah. But I think sort of in our time, maybe the classic one that would be most often pointed to it is, is Matthew Sleeth's Serve God, Save the Planet as sort of an introductory um, into just being thoughtful about the, the impact of our behavior on other people. And then certainly there's a, a whole wealth of, of deeper theological works around that. But I would say that was kind of an introductory one that a lot of people will um, have and it'll at least spark good conversations and good thinking. Um, I like when you talk about the practical step you can do. Um, I was reading, well, skip that, just to say that I think there are a lot of things that if we took the biblical commands seriously would have a massive environmental impact. For example, what would our landfills look like if thou shalt not covet was lived out? What would our world look like if self-control was actually practiced? Um, and so for me, so many of these things come back to spiritual disciplines. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be preachy here, but just realistic about, do I actually need that extra thing? Um, that there's a level of maybe the first step in living an ecologically friendly life is fasting for spiritual discipline and practicing self-control and being mindful of what God has for you and learning to deny your body things that you don't actually need to not do things on an impulse. Maybe that's the first step. Um, and so I would, I would push it back into a, a deeper spiritual pattern of being, um, and I have 12 other ones of those actually, but that's for another talk. But All I right. think thinking about it like yeah. that, what if we actually practically lived out the things that Jesus had for us to do? Um, what would the trajectory look like as that multiplies and manifests in my life and in my community? That's great. I think we'll just leave it there then because that pushes us deeper to really um, get into what it is. I was just, um, in Romans and it says, if the law, it was talking about the law and coveting. Mm -hmm. If the law didn't tell me to covet, I wouldn't know that coveting was wrong. And it's like, why does he pick that in particular? And I was like, I think there's something to that because within our world, coveting is just fine. Yeah. You know, but then the, the law reveals that. <laughs> coveting I, is what her I was like, is oh, based the, on. Yeah, it's like the <laughs> wisdom of like, Choosing that particular thing I thought was really interesting. Well, great. For those in um, audience, can we give them a hand? Thank you, guys. Thank you, Zandra. Yeah, great. And I'm going to close this out here. So thank you, guys. <clears throat> Fantastic. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed tonight. I think of Nathan's talk and some of the things he said. He says, God is the righteous one who puts us together. There is a God who will preserve us all. And Christ deeply affirms creation when he steps into it. I love that. God cares about the environment. God cares about you and he cares about me. If you love God, but don't care about the environment, I think this has given us a good time to pause and ask why. And if you love the environment, but you don't care about God, I think it also gives us time to pause and ask why. Could it be that your love for the environment is something that points back to the God who created it, this world we exist in, and called it good. Something to think about. So 
If you enjoyed this event, please join us for other events in the future. You can go to rzm.org and check that out. Just so you know, on June 12th, you could put that on your calendar. We will have another Trending the Questions event here at the Zacharias Institute. And we haven't figured out exactly the question we're going to be dealing with, but it will probably be around the topic of race. So look forward to that on June 12th. And then actually next Friday, March 20th, here from the Institute, we are going to be live streaming a Q&A with Abdu Murray, Vince Vitale, and Joe Vitale. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Uh, you won't want to miss that. And keep, if you follow RZIM, we will be sharing soon about how you can start to share your questions throughout the week leading up to that event. So make sure you could probably find that on RZIM Instagram or Facebook, wherever you follow them there. You can go to rzm.org. And one of the best places I think to go to is if you go to rzm.org, you scroll to the bottom and there's a place you can put your email and you can subscribe to the RZM Digest. It's an email that goes out every two weeks. You find about all the new articles, new podcasts, other material that the team is producing, and then any events that we're just randomly trying to pop up. We are continuing to step into the digital space and produce more and more digital content. And sometimes that will be just the week before we decide we're going to do an event because we can, because we have cameras and we have the technology to let us do that. So you don't want to miss that when that comes up. So make sure you subscribe to that. And also, don't forget to head over to RZM Connect and join our community there. I might try to get Nathan to drop his um, like recipe for, not recipe, the ingredients for how to make soap. I'm, I'm kind of interested in that. Um, and other little details if we can. So thank you all for tuning in. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. And God bless you all.